And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Benched with Bubba, episode 613. Got a couple friends of the show, got to see them less than a month ago, actually. It's crazy, not even that long still in Arizona. You guys obviously know who they are, especially as the prospect world continues to grow. They are at the forefront of this situation. They have an amazing podcast, the Tool Shed Podcast, but they also have their own little ventures on the side. One you can find at Rotoballer and FTN Fantasy, and he's on Twitter at Eric Cross 4 Eric, how are we doing, my friend? Doing well, Bubba. Doing well. Dude, it's, it's crazy. Clegg and I were just talking about how crazy it was that we hit 250 episodes. And here you are, like, you know, two and a half times that up over 600. So it just speaks to the longevity and, and all the great stuff you've been doing, man. Thanks for appreciate having me on. It. Got a little bit of a head start, but I appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> the person, the aforementioned Clegg on the show, you can find his work over at the Dynasty Dugout, which he's just cranking out articles every single day twice a day i don't know it's like i get updates on my Substack app over and over again <laughs> and he's on twitter at roto clegg chris clegg how we doing my friend i'm doing pretty good good to see you again even though it's virtually and not in arizona be nice to be back in some warmer weather is it's eric has gotten like main cold here like we're gonna be down in the 20s tonight so that's pretty dang cold for south carolina oh wow so, dude yeah it, it's funny because you usually whenever clay complains about it being cold i'm like dude it's like 30 degrees colder here so shush but yeah, uh no that's pretty yeah, like we, a 24 yeah. low i don't like that <laughs> yeah actually right now it is it's a eighth bow well, 8 30 eastern time we're at 30 degrees right now so jeez oh, yeah, like we get overnight frost advisories but then it's like 70 by the end of the day so <laughs> just, just uh, anything melts right away usually yeah it, it's weird but uh i i get annoyed by it because it makes my golf round go off like a half hour later than usual but oh, no. uh, at least I get, to, <laughs> I get to golf in the winter time because i do a golf show and my buddy lives in kentucky he hates me for like four months out of the year because he's not golfing oh, but, i'm sure uh, so yeah, I, I can relate to the co-host and the uh, the weather situation. Let's put it that way. But uh, before we get rocking and rolling, why don't you guys like discuss what you got going on, Clay? You got the dynasty dugout. Why don't you plug away? Yeah, so pretty much all dynasty and prospect stuff for me now. I've cut pretty much all redraft content. Just kind of focused on that niche of prospects and turning out a lot at the dynasty dugout. We're doing team prospect write ups right now. Trying to go in depth on all fantasy relevant prospects for dynasty leagues, both shallow and deep, uh, deep leagues as well. So it's all going to culminate to like a top 750 to a thousand di- uh, prospect ranking at the end, which is kind of wild, but uh, kind of s- what I want to do with it. And then uh, we're building some new tools too for, for dynasty managers to kind of make, make life easier in addition to the trade calculator. So I think that'll be pretty cool, but yeah, you can check all those out the dynasty dugout.com. If you like, and you can find it all on Twitter as well, or or X, I guess I should say, uh, yeah, at Roto Clegg. Yeah, it's, it is still uh, Twitter. Always Twitter. It'll, it'll Twitter. never be X it'll, to me. Sorry, I, I sorry Elon. I tried that like the first couple of podcasts, and I just couldn't even like, it's just like, now it's Twitter. If you don't like it, sorry. It's just what it's going to be called. Yeah. Um, Eric, besides having to edit my wonderful catchers for the Black Book in a few days, what else do you have going on these days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, Black Book's coming to a head here. That's going to be awesome, obviously. Great group of uh, people we got over there every year, led by the the one, the only Joe Pisa Pia. Uh, yeah, I got you know it's kind of similar to Clegg doing a lot of you know dynasty content over on uh, my Patreon, Toolshed Fantasy, doing also team prospect rankings. I, I do list a, a little bit of uh, redraft stuff there with some early twenty twenty four rankings. Kind of dipping my toes into the projections world, which is uh, a beast <laughs> to say yeah. the least. And uh, but yeah, and also doing stuff over at Rotoball or FTN. As well, and then obviously the uh, toolship, the aforementioned toolship podcast. Yeah, and uh, the toolship podcast is one that I really appreciate because, like, I'll say it's like James Anderson and and Welsh. We're all kind of you guys are all in the the same kind of niche, like that part of it, where I'm not a diehard dynasty guy, but you guys keep the redraft with the prospect thing flowing in that show, so it it helps idiots like me out. That's why obviously you're on the show to help idiots like me out. So um, that that's why I appreciate about, appreciate about it because there's a lot of great podcasts with Dynasty talk and it just loses me once you get to like hey this single A guy <laughs> is going to be great in like s- six years and I'm like yeah, I don't even know if I'll be alive in six years so let's just let's, <laughs> like, let's focus on the now right now yeah uh, the Toolship podcast is awesome guys it's a, and for anybody like most people probably don't pay attention but idiots like me that do podcasting you know we check charts and uh, the Toolshed show is up there quite near the top with uh, the big boys so. They're doing something right, which is pretty darn good. All right, let's talk real quick before we go, we're going to go team by team and talk about potential 2024 draft champions targets uh, since uh, 2023 was a crazy prospect year. So let's talk about 2023 real quick here. And I want to get your thoughts on this as prospect guys. Um, 
it was insane. All the call ups we got, and it wasn't like it was insane because it was all throughout the year for one, and it was just so many of them. It wasn't just like you know, a couple weeks towards you know the, the cutoff dates and we got them all. It was everywhere, every weekend, the next best thing, insanity, and it never ended. You felt like it would, it never did. I'll start with you, Eric. Like, what was your thoughts on what we saw in 2023? And like thinking back, how should we have reacted to it? Did we react to it? Like, what was your overall thoughts on the, the prospect barrage? Yeah, it it was just crazy because you know, we all knew that you know that there was gonna be a change and that these you know, a lot of these teams would be more aggressive, but obviously we didn't have any idea of how aggressive they were going to be. And I think it's fair to say that it probably exceeded most people's expectations for you know how hot and heavy the prospect call ups were gonna be. And I think it was hard, especially like in weekly fab leagues, to you know, you're you're trying to get obviously you want to get some of those guys, but do I, how much of my money do I save? So I think it was hard to kind of plan fab out because you know it was just so many guys, like you said. Like I remember, like in like I think it was like May, maybe early June, when there was like a big pitching prospect like five weeks in a row mm-hmm. uh, that all these guys are going for like you know two hundred plus bucks or something in that range. So it was crazy, and but it was awesome. Obviously, yeah. you know, Click and I doing a lot, a lot of prospect stuff, and you know these guys getting called up earlier and teams getting incentivized to call them up. It was great. I think it's great for the game. So, so much young talent that we've seen over the last handful of years kind of come come up and you know make immediate impacts. But I think now that we have a rough idea, and of course it could change again, but I think we have we'll be better prepared for it next year after having a year under our belt. So I think I'll be a little bit easier to you know set those fab bids every week. And the easier prepared parts are kind of the funny part about it because I think we were so excited out the gate because we're not used to it all the time. Like, let's spend all our money and have fun. And then it's just like, mm-hmm. wait a minute. Like, here we go. Here we go. Here we... Now Matt McClain doesn't even care about it. He's one of the best ones to pick up because right. there's just no funds available. It's just, and not saying that would have changed a ton, but it's just crazy thinking about the, the landscape. Chris, when you when it was taking place last year, like, how did you see it? Did, was it a surprise to you or was it just like, I, like, what was your thoughts on 2023? Yeah. And I think it was kind of, you know, I won't say we saw it coming, but we kind of saw the progress in 2022 with the aggressiveness of teams and the prospects. And then, you know, we saw it like down the stretch of 2022 where like Corbin Carroll, Gunnar Henderson were brought up, but just late enough to keep the service time to Mm -hmm. win rookie of the years. Obviously that's what they were going for. So teams are getting these players feet wet and there's going to go all in the next season because there's incentives. They want those draft picks and, you know, they, they get something out of it now, which is, is pretty useful, but I think we're just seeing the case now where teams just don't want to waste bullets in the minors. They don't want to waste their talent down there. And I think there's a lot more disparity. Like I, I go to single a and high a games a lot. That's what's around me. And honestly, the talent like sucks in a lot of places. I mean, it's just not good. And so like, there's so much disparity in minor league ball. The big shots are going to stand out and teams are going to be aggressive. Like, we saw AJ Smith Shaver at 20 years old go from high A to the majors in the matter of of a month and a half. Like it was crazy that kind of jump. But like Alex and thought I was at his triple A only triple A start at home, and like Alex and Thopulus was there, and like he was literally like, we just think he's as good as everybody in this triple A rotation, so we want to see what he's got. And the next start he's in Atlanta, which is wild. Uh, but that's just kind of the nature of the game now. I think we're going to see teams be more aggressive. I think you're going to see more prospects break camp. We saw all this stuff about Jackson Churio today, potentially getting an extension, and then he's going to be in the opening day lineup if that's the case. I wouldn't be surprised if we see more teams look to do that as they look to try to get deals with these guys, but also get them on the field sooner, and that's kind of a way to do that. So it, it's probably going to be even more next year, but it feels like the talent is just not as deep in the sense of we saw so many guys come up and graduate last year. That's a couple of things. I love the idea that – why waste the bullets in the minors? I said about pitching forever because almost every pitcher gets at least one one Tommy John now. So what are we even doing? Like letting them like <laughs> if they think they're somewhat good enough, let's just see what they got, boys and girls. I think that's now that the hitters are a different story and it works out pretty well for them too, obviously. But to Chris's last point there, and that's kind of been my conundrum for a while. And I've talked to a bunch of guys, even in FPAS about it and other places, is so many of them came up. Chris mentioned that other spots in the minors, the talent level is just not great, which I agree. I go to like the San Jose Giants and it's fun, but you're looking at a bunch of guys going, man, when I played high school ball, like this seemed similar. Like, <laughs> what are we, what are we doing here? And um, so how could we see 2024 be the same if the talent pool keeps that you see what I'm saying there? So how do we foresee it going in 2024? Is there that much still very good talent that can come up or do you think it's kind of going to 
even out a little bit here. I, I think there could be, you know, just as much talent. Maybe a slight drop off, but just looking at like my overall prospect rankings here, and a lot of these guys, especially like a lot of the guys in the top ten, are going to be up this year. Like you look at my top ten right now, and the only, you know, I don't think there's anybody in my current top ten that there's like a zero percent shot. Like a lot of these guys got to be up early, you know, like you know the Langfords, you know, Holidays, Cheerios, Camineros already up, obviously, uh, you know, Cruz, Carter, these guys, and. There's a lot of other big names too, so I think it's going to be another pretty good year, especially on the hitting side. I'm I'm still kind of wondering how the pitching side. There's, obviously, there's some good names there too that could come up, but I think it might be a more of a step back on the pitching side than hitting. I, I'd be interested to hear what uh what you think on that, Clegg. Yeah, it's just, just the case where so many of the pitchers came up and graduated yep. last year, where it's just not as stacked at the top, and like people are going to holler like for Paul Skeens, but why would the Pirates rush him? I just don't see why they would rush him when they're not going to contend. I mean, I, I do think that if teams like, let's say the Orioles or the Blue Jays, excuse me, if uh, Ricky Tiedemann is healthy and coming out of spring training, he's going to be in the opening day rotation because he's been so injury prone in the past. Why are they going to waste him in the minor leagues? They saw what they needed to see in the minors and then the fall league. Like Ricky Tiedemann's a guy we'll probably talk about, but I think that he's, he's a guy that's going to be in the opening day ro rotation if he's healthy. And I think you're going to see some of these contending teams be more aggressive with these arms. And really, it's just we'll have to see how the offseason shakes out, obviously, with, with teams making moves and where there's openings. But I think you're going to see some aggressiveness. But the talent gap, I would say, with pitchers was a little bit better last year than this year. Which makes sense, I guess, to like if you think of just the overall, so many pitchers got called up last year. So eventually they have to kind of reload the system at some point in time. And now just tell me if I'm crazy on this one. I remember talking with Bloomfield about this, like right at the end of the season, we were kind of talking about all these prospects that got called up and how do you kind of reevaluate the situation? And it felt just from like a broad lens going in a lot of like the kind of cheaper teams, quote unquote, were the more aggressive in calling up players because you know, you get them, you get them going, maybe make the deals like the Brewers want to do. Like you saw the Reds, you saw the Guardians, you saw some of these teams that aren't really super aggressive. Now the Braves, of course, did their thing, but in reality, they act cheap on a very good budget because they're good at it. Um, I'll start with you, Chris. Did you see like a trend made, or just kind of was just fluky into something that really isn't sustainable type thing? I think like the Reds case, like they just had the spots available and all those guys were just were just ready at that point. But I do think that you're onto something for sure because these teams are going to try to compete like in this certain window. And like I think you're going to – it's interesting like with the Diamondbacks. Like they made it to the World Series. They called up Lawler, but there is still a big kind of glob of talent that's coming probably this year that hasn't come up yet. But the teams that don't have as big of budgets are – not in these big markets are, are going to try to do this where they're going to try to set this contention window and win with these prospects while they have them. The Dodgers don't have to do that. I mean, we've seen them keep down Michael Bush, what seems like 20 years now. And you know, like Gavin Lux, I mean, if Gavin Lux finally got a spot, then he got hurt, but this Miguel Vargas, we can keep going on and on with these guys that the Dodgers, these guys would start on either team, but the Dodgers and you have to be like a, a 60 grade on the, 2080 scale to start in LA versus where these smaller market teams, there's just openings. The A's, I mean, the A's were very aggressive. I mean, why not? You know, so when they have the openings and they're cheaper and they're trying to somehow put together a contender, they're going to kind of glob these prospects together and push them pretty aggressively. I want to ask you, Eric, and then we'll kind of get into the teams here pretty soon. When you're drafting, and I, I know I've drafted with you before, and I know you do like your prospects when we draft. I, um, not in every draft, but I've seen seen some. Um, will you be maybe more aggressive, or you more like uh, to adapt this year, knowing this is going to be the case from now on, or is it still kind of a case by case situation? I think it's still more of a case by case situation. I think I will be aggressive, not early. But more maybe in like you know three hundred to four hundred you know range in, in, in DCs and whatnot. So I I still even with teams being more aggressive, that doesn't mean like you know prospects are going to dominate quicker out of the gate. I mean obviously they could with the talented ones, but it's not you know there's no guarantee that these prospects are going to you know have a higher hit rate than they did in the past when teams weren't being as aggressive. So I'm I'm still a little bit leery in that regard. Obviously we've seen great prospects come up. And have their speed bumps. It's natural part of the you know player development. Not all development is linear, uh, which I think gets kind of lost in the discussion a lot of times. 
But at the same time, you know, I, I will be willing, if I have a good core uh, already that I feel good about where I'm like, all right, I can, you know, maybe take a shot here with, you know, some upside, you know, plays, you know, once I have, once I have my core in place. Yeah. I, I think maybe I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take a, a shot on maybe one or two more guys than I, than I would have uh, previously, just because I know there's, they're going to be up earlier uh, than they were in the past. So yeah, I think a bit more aggressive, but still not in, on the earlier part of the drafts. What about you, Clegg? Yeah, I think that there are certain situations where it can pay off, like Julio Rodriguez two years ago. Like yeah. there was kind of the writing on the wall, and we saw his ADP just fault like significantly, like over the final month of draft season. So by main like main events, he was going like top one hundred, where you could have got him like you know three hundred to four fifty previously. So I think that there, in some cases, are opportunities, but for the most part, I think that I tend to wait and find those guys that are. I won't say deeper cuts, but maybe people think don't have as much of a chance to come up and contribute. Like Gavin Williams is somebody that I got in every DC last year. And yeah, you know, he spent cool. a serviceable amount of time in the majors and was really good. So those are the kind of guys I'm looking for. I'm not really looking for like the top ranked dogs by most, but those guys that I think still have the high ceilings and could tr- contribute. And I grab them really late. That's why I got you guys here. Cause like, Jackson Trio is going to be fun. We know his name's going to come up. Wyatt Langford's already going pretty high in drafts, stuff like that. But I'm more the let's get my base in play and then let's kind of draft the guys later in the draft that might have an impact throughout the season. So let's just have some fun here. We'll go team by team. I got them alphabetical order. We'll do AL first, then the NL. And obviously, I just went through roster resource and thought these are names I know that I've heard have a chance. You guys could definitely direct me in a different direction. Like I was an idiot and forgot Ricky Tiedemann, so I already put that down with Toronto. It's like, duh, he's coming up. But uh, let's start with Baltimore here. Jackson Holiday is the big name. Like the dude went through almost every level of the minors last year, played great, uh, top pick. There's rumors he might start the t- with the team. There's a great chance he's with the team very early in the season. So start with you, Eric, on this one. How are you looking at Jackson Holiday from a DC perspective? I think he's one where I think the ADP is is higher than I want to go with Holiday, and that's no knock against him whatsoever. Obviously, you know one of the best pure hitters we've seen come through the minors over the last you know half decade or, or longer. A guy that's gonna you know, maybe be a 300 career hitter in the major leagues. You know, obviously having. You know, a uh, you know, all-star father helps, and obviously his, his little brother's pretty damn good too. Uh, coming up through the uh, pipeline a couple years later, but yeah, I, I just I'm not sure if like that big impact is coming right away because I think he's still developing, he's still putting on weight. You know, so I don't know if like the, the power impact will be there right away, or at least not to the degree that people are hoping it's going to be. I, I think like 2025 would like really be the year to invest in, in Holiday, but. In general, I wouldn't be opposed, but I think from what I've seen, the price is a good 50, 100 picks higher than uh, – or earlier, I should say, than what I'd want to go. And see, that's the other problem I have is you look at these players, and I'm thinking – you mentioned he has to develop still these other things. Like, how what impact does he have? Like you said, his ADP through 19 draft champions drafts 192. Like, that's a top 200 pick. That's, that's yeah. a little rich. So, Clay, what do you got on uh, Jackson Holiday? Somewhere to cross, uh, cross on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think that – he probably is up early. I'm not doubting that. I, I think the Orioles are obviously in full stride contention mode here. And they're probably not going to continue to run out like they did last year when they've got holiday way. I mean, Jorge Mateo really sl- fell off. So there's the opportunity here for holiday just to step in and take the shortstop gig. Now we'll say, I think holiday's a second baseman long-term. I'll be curious, you know, what they decide to do here at least this year, but Holiday to me probably needs a year of seasoning in the majors before he really takes off from like a fantasy perspective. The contact's really good. He doesn't swing and miss often in the zone, makes good contact. The power, I think, is still the question mark. Like, what does he get to? The body, you know, it's you look at Matt Holiday and he doesn't follow that line. And, and Jackson's little brother, Ethan, actually has his dad's body. And and Jackson does not. So he's a little skinnier. He doesn't have a ton of room to fill out. The EVs were fine last year. He's like a 102, 90th, so slightly below average, which I think is pretty good for the 87 average EV. So, you know, Holiday, I think, will be solid. He'll be great long term. But for 2024, like, I'm not like heavily investing in him. So I think the price tag will outweigh what you get like, potential return. I'm on board with you there, and I, again, not a prospect guy. So I, I, I'm just a guy that just got drafted this last year. Wasn't he out of high school? Am I wrong on that one? Like straight out of high school? Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's a 
that's a, a quite the jump. He's not King Griffey Jr. Last time I checked, so that's that's a leap. Who is? Um, <laughs> yeah, true, exactly. Uh, anybody else on the Orioles that stands out to you guys? Because I felt like they called a lot of their main guys up last year. We've seen Rushman in recent recent years. You know, the, the rookie of the year, Henderson. Uh, we just got Westberg last year. Like you know, their outfielders, there's a few guys we saw little cups of coffee with last year. Anybody else stand out to you guys? Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Eric. Uh, so the, the, the two of the ones, though, obviously there's so many options, like all the guys they already brought up. The two of the ones that really stick out uh, that haven't debuted yet, Kobe Mayo and, and Connor Norby. More so Mayo. Though I, I like Norby a decent amount, too. He's a top 100 prospect for me. But Mayo's a guy that he's probably up, I'd probably say midseason sometime, though maybe earlier. I mean, he got, got up to AAA into last year and made a lot of improvements at the plate as like a pure hitter and has big time power. Uh, that I don't even think the, the the left field fences moving out will affect him much at all because this guy's got like big time juice. So I uh, w- w- want to see where they kind of fit him in and and when. But uh, yeah, Mayo's a guy that I'd be really intrigued to uh, see how big the fab bits get on him, especially if he, if he starts the year out pretty hot at AAA. Sweet. Anybody else for you, Clegg? Yeah, I mean we saw Histon Kerstad come up and hit some bombs down the stretch. I think he'll be probably he may start in AAA. And he also is more than capable of starting the opening day lineup too. They have so many guys. I do think there's probably a trade for a starting Bingo. pitcher. Bingo. Yep. Um, and so the hitters are probably going to get moved. On the pitcher side, though, I would say Chase McDermott is somebody that I'm targeting really late. Uh, former Astros farmhand uh, McDermott had an incredible like, down-the-stretch run once he got to AAA, and he was absolutely nasty. There's some walk issues, but they're they're manageable, and I think the stuff's so good with McDermott that he may be a sneaky one that can get in there and get some starts for a, a really good Baltimore team, have a chance at wins and also, you know, be really viable for fantasy. So he's like a really late DC target that I like a lot. And you see like the walk rate improved pretty much all season. Like he was like, a you look at the overall line and he had like a 14% walk rate on the year, but towards the end of the year, he dropped below like over the second half below 10%, which is really encouraging there. And so, Really in on McDermott, strong arsenal, and that's uh, somebody I'll be heavily invested in. Nice. All right, Eric, this is your backyard. Boston Red Sox. Uh, I saw you tweet about Sedan Rafaela the other day. That was a guy I loved and fab everywhere the last month. In DFS, he was 2K every day. I'm like, I'll take my chances with him. I know you like him. You can talk about him, obviously. But who else are you seeing in Boston to stand out? Because I didn't find a ton in my you know genius research. No, I, I think if, if we're talking like – big or potentially big impact for fantasy. It's really just Rafaela this year. I, I think I, you'll get some other guys, obviously, you know, will your Brayo already came up, had some time last year and you'll probably see uh, you know, some Nick York this year, probably mid season later on. I could see that, you know, maybe some Marcelo may or Roman Anthony. I, I could see them debuting uh, later in the season as well, but yeah, for impact, it's really uh, Rafaela uh, this year. And, I want to see that. So I'm hoping all this rumors about a potential Verdugo trade for like a, you know, a second baseman or something like that. You know, Glaber Torres, I would love. I don't know how much validity yeah. there is to those rumors or if the Yankees should even do that. Will the Yankees really do that with the Red Sox? I don't, I don't think I so. I would be blown I away. I doubt that's the case. No, jo- Jonathan India. I think that'd be a solid that'd fit too, cool. but uh, yeah. just anything to open up a spot. That's, I want to see both uh, Duran and Rafaela. Okay. And then Rafaela is, is super aggressive. But at the same time, he doesn't swing and miss too much. Solid contact rates, and he has that pull. Yeah, he can get to that pull side power, which obviously at Fenway, you know, is, is a pretty pretty good thing f- for a righty. And obviously, very great athlete, good good defensive center fielder as well, uh, and can play a little bit of middle infield too. So I think he's a guy that could be, you know, over full season, you know, 25, 30 steals right away, and maybe give you double digit home runs and respectable average. So yeah, I think Rafaela, he's going. I think his ADP was right around five hundred. Uh, from yeah, what I was seeing on NFBC. It's, so it's that's, I think that's great for what he could potentially do if given enough time. That's I, absolutely a risk worth taking at that point. Yeah, his ADP right now is, yeah, three, 350, 350. So it's gone oh, up a little it's bit. It's gone up, okay. I'm in a little bit, but yeah, he's still not a bad price tag because I, I, I saw everything you're talking about is what I read a lot about last year. Got me very excited on him. Um, what about you, Clay? You got anything on the Red Sox? No, I don't think we see Roman Anthony until later in the season. Marcelo Mayer has a lot of work to do. He's coming off a big injury as well. Yeah, And so those names you're not really looking to get this year. The pit on the pitching side, 
I don't see any of the the big time starters getting reps. I mean, you may see like a Brandon Walter or Shane Drohan, but those aren't fantasy viable guys in my opinion. So I did just randomly pluck a bullpen guy, and that's Isaiah Campbell, who they just got in the Luis Arias trade. I have no clue how he fits in this picture. Obviously, you know, Kinley's going to be the closer, but Campbell actually has really intriguing stuff, and it feels like they got a, a steal here where Campbell came up with the Mariners last year and saw a little time, but he's been really solid throughout his minor league career, and he's got a really good fastball slider combo, which I think can play. I mean, the sweeper gets a ton of uh, horizontal movement on it. Sweeper has uh, 13 inches of average horizontal movement and pretty good depth with it as well. So um, that's just a, a random deep dart throw because there's nobody else really here. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of random deep dart throws, let's talk Chicago White Sox. This is a team that's just a disaster given they're trying to build depth with the trade with the Braves and some other things. Now the quality of the depth, that's another story, but they're trying to build depth. Um, we'll, we'll let you start with this one, Chris. Um, I, I don't have any faith in the White Sox to even develop players, let alone bring them to the bigs, but I'll let you have the floor on this one. <laughs> hey, you mentioned uh, Corey Lee on the sheet. I think that Lee is going to probably be the starting catcher, uh, bearing some kind of move. I'm not sure he's somebody that I'm looking to invest in outside like a last round DC pick for like if you want a fourth catcher. Yep. He's a very late target. He looked pretty horrific um, in his small sample last year of being called up. So Corey Lee's a non investment. I think you'll see Jared Schuster in the rotation. Depends on if you want to invest in him or not. I mean, we saw how he was in Atlanta, he wasn't great. They traded him over. I have little faith in him. You also mentioned Edgar Caro, where I think he certainly is one of the best catcher catching prospects in baseball. I'm not sure they push him aggressively they enough. They have no need to push him. <laughs> right. Yeah. Why? And, and he's been pushed. Like he's young. He's still 20 years old and he's been aggressively pushed throughout his career. But I'm not really seeing it. But I will say, I do think that a healthy Colson Montgomery is probably the starting shortstop for this team. Uh, by at least June, July. I mean, they signed Paul DeYoung. I don't really see that going that well. <laughs> no. I mean, That's such no. a White Sox signing. <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. So I think Colson's the big one. If you're willing to sit on him long enough, I think that if he's healthy, and that's a big caveat. I mean, he we saw him, he was wearing a back brace in one of the games in the yeah. AFL. We saw him. Um, we obviously interviewed him and he, like, that's their buddy Colson Montgomery, by yeah. the way, for those that didn't see that's their buddy. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he said he was fully healthy. I, you know, I mean, obviously you guys going to say that, but I also think you may see Brian Ramos on a similar timeline who we also saw in the AFL. Uh, I mean, he's a big power guy. He's got respectable contact as well. Uh, we'll slot over there at third base. Um, I'm a little surprised that you on Moncada still on this team, but who knows? <laughs> Uh, you all might got a surprise he's still on this team. <laughs> probably, probably so. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of intrigue here, in my opinion. Um, but I actually, there is one. I forgot. I scrolled down and forgot about Nick Nostrini, who I think will be um, a big impact pitcher for them. He may step in and be the best pitcher in the rotation if Dylan Cease is traded. Um, Nostrini came over from the Dodgers in a trade, and Nostrini's got really, really good stuff. And he was – Struggling with command with the Dodgers. Surprisingly, he looked better once he came over and was pitching in AAA Charlotte with the White Sox. I don't know how, but uh, you're looking at a, a fastball changeup curve and slider, even with a little bit of cutter mixed in. So he's got solid command on most of the pitches. Um, the curveball, there's just inconsistencies with uh, the amount of strikes he's throwing with it, but like he's throwing enough strikes to be a starter, but if that command ticks up even the slight bit, I think Nostrini will be the best pitcher in the rotation. That'll be my bold take. So Nostrini's another good late target there with the Sox. What about you, Cross? Yeah, not not a, not a whole lot to add here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Obviously, you know, Ramos I think is underrated. Montgomery is solid. Those will be later guys uh, this season. And yeah, Corey Lee though, like I was going to mention. Like, I didn't realize how bad he actually was. I guess it was 70 plate appearances, but his slash line was 077, 143, 138. Again, small sample size, but that's, yeah, that's not going to, yeah, he's like 
Chris said it well. Like, you know, like, oh crap, I need another catcher. Oh, Corey <laughs> Lee's still sitting there. You know, yeah. he's, he's gonna start. <laughs> I know that's, right? that's where I'm at. I'm holding out optimism. Like, we get you know a full season. He might track some of his late, uh, you know, Triple A numbers in the last few seasons with Houston. Maybe he gets some comfortability. I don't know. But right. he's a, he's been a fourth outfield target. He's like five. 90 ADP, right? Now. Right. And, and real, real quick on Edgar K. Rowe, like how, I feel bad for him. Like he went from the Angels org to the White Sox org. Like what, what's next? The Rockies org? I, 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 I feel bad for the guy. He's going to be in the California he, Penal League pretty soon. He, he's talented, but man, yeah, I, I don't think we see him much this year. Maybe second half, but yeah, not a lot of, uh, you know, exciting young talent in that organization. Let's talk about a fun team now, the Cleveland Guardians, who continue to develop. They were uh, one of the big talks of the town in the AFL. We know Kyle Manzardo is very likely good, great chance, I think, of starting the team, or at least early in the season. Could be wrong. He's got an ADP of 321 right now. Uh, Chase DeLauder had a great AFL, 592 ADP. And then George Valera is another name that's mentioned a lot. He's got a 719 ADP. So, Eric, how are you looking at this Cleveland situation who might have some people worth taking this year? Yeah, and obviously DeLauder and Manzardo are the two big ones here. And I think, you know, Manzardo's ready now. I think he's that advanced of a bat. And obviously, you know, I don't hold what, you know, his kind of subpar year against him what, with what he had going on off the field. And then DeLauder, you know, I don't think he's up quite as early as Manzardo, but I think DeLauder's nearly ready. Like this is an advanced bat, you know, puts the bat on the ball, the power's there. You know, good athlete as well. People knock him for the swing, which I think is just complete crap. I think the swing's fine, uh, especially with, with you see what he what he's doing with, with the swing. Um, out, outside of those two big names, I mean, I'm not really looking to invest in Valera. You know, these so much durability issues that he's dealt with you know, over over the last few years. Uh, so I don't, even if he is, I don't know where he fits in to this picture long term. You know, outside, you know, maybe you get um, some Brian Rocio. You know, maybe you get a Juan Brito. These are guys, but I don't think I'm really looking to you know, even draft them in DCs late because if they come up, it's probably later and, and not m- much of a, a big impact. But yeah, it's really just the big ones with uh, DeLauder and Manzardo here. You similar on this one, Clay, or do you got somebody else? Yeah, I mean, you're certainly going to want to invest in both those guys. I don't think they're going to sit on DeLauder, and I'm pretty confident that Manzardo is their starting first baseman. Um, or at least DH, DH first base with him Let's and Naylor. Josh Naylor some respect here. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I think they're both going <laughs> to see time at both spots. So, uh, you know, that'll be fun. They brought up most of the pitchers that they had last year, obviously with Bybee and Logan Allen and Gavin Williams. So that'll be interesting to kind of see uh, which way they go there. I love Juan Brito a lot, but I'm not sure they they push him. I think he got up to double A this year. I, I would bet on him being in triple a for most of the year. And so those are probably the big names. I have zero interest in Valera, but if you want like a power bat late, then John Kenzie Noel, maybe somebody to look at. Um, Jonathan Rodriguez is another outfielder who's a little older. He's 24 now, but he had a really strong season in triple a. And if Joey Cantillo can get his command together, the stuff is, is really good. He displayed it in the futures game. Um, Really solid, but the command's just all over the place right now. He had a thirteen um, percent walk rate last year in AAA and fourteen and a half in AA last year. Ooh. So, got to get that under control. But that's probably a long dart throw. But yeah, the system's got some fun names for sure. Let's just have some fun, a little higher or lower based on these ADPs. Do you think they go higher or lower? They should go higher or lower. Kyle Mazzaro three twenty one cross. I think that's I hate that like higher. I mean, like better, like two hundreds. Not, I know it's always backwards. When I say higher right. and lower. Do you think he should be better than three twenty one? I mean, maybe I, I would. I think that's actually pretty fair uh, ADP in general. But if I had to lean one way, I, I could see him getting taken more on like the, you know two fifty two seventy five range. Uh, just given the you know the early ADP and, and maybe even on opening day and what he's capable of. Uh, but yeah, I think that's actually a pretty fair ADP right now. What about you, Chris. I think it's fair. I think I'd take him around the 300 mark if I was confident that he would be in the opening day lineup. He probably moves up, and I would bet we see that happening. You know, come if he's rake like raking in March. Yeah, yeah he probably moves up to the 250 range. I'd guess that's what's good. That's why I think this is an early ADP to enjoy. Yep. Um, Chase DeLauder is 592. What do you think about that one, Clegg? Yeah, I mean, I think that he's probably not up on opening day. 
but he's probably up in the first couple of months. So I think that is one to invest in as well at that price and DCs, especially Eric hundred percent. Unless he's, you know, for some odd reason, not up to like August, I think this could be a great value. And I, I think you'll see that like, he's a guy too. that like, if he h- hits well in spring training, I think you see that start creeping up in like the 400 something range for sure. All right. Let's talk to Detroit Tigers here. Colt Keith is a very popular name in the DC streets, ADP of 331. Wilmer Flores, the uh, younger Wilmer Flores, not my Wilmer Flores, different Wilmer Flores. Um, <laughs> he's got an ADP around 691. We saw him in the AFL. Chris, so I'll start with you on this one. What are your thoughts on the Tiger situation? It has some opportunity. We obviously have seen um, Torkel, Spencer Torkelson come up and you struggle, but then kind of get it going. So that was encouraging to see at least his progress this year and Riley Green. You know, if healthy, see some progress as well. But obviously those guys aren't prospects. The openings right now in their lineup, there's not a ton. But I think Parker Meadows is obviously still a prospect. He came up down the stretch. And I think Parker Meadows is probably somebody to invest in. I think Colt Keith is probably up fairly early. And I think Wilmer Flores is likely a reliever. I think that's where he suits in best. And his stuff can really play up there. But I will say that if Matt Manning and Casey Mize can't stay healthy, and they've never stayed healthy at any point in their <laughs> career, so why would we trust them? I mean, Kent Maeda has not stayed healthy. Tariq Skubal, nobody in their rotation has stayed healthy at all. It's probably the most injury-prone rotation that there is right now. So there are some opportunities. I'm not sure Jackson Jobs in the opening day rotation, but I will say I think that Ty Madden has an opportunity. Obviously, Sawyer Gibson Long that we saw come up, but Ty Madden's the really deep cut where he made major strides down the stretch. He made some tweaks in his arsenal. He really improved the command. And I think Madden could be one that contributes in a big way next year that is on nobody's radar at all. What about you, Eric? Yeah, obviously, you know, Keith's the big name, and I, and I agree 100% with what Clay said about the rotation. Uh, another, But another name here that I'm going to have a lot of shares at, especially as his ADP right now, 544 through 19 DCs. And that's Justin Henry Malloy. I, I think he's going to be, he, he's absolutely not the flashiest guy. I think that part of that kind of goes into his ranking, how he's never been, you know, super highly ranked, even though he's been a pretty, you know, solid prospect, uh, even dating back to his days in the, in the Atlanta Braves uh, organization. Um, but maybe a guy that, you know, best case scenario, is like a Brian Reynolds type of guy that's, you know, solid average, you know, decent, but not great pop. Maybe even adds in a, a little bit of speed here and there. Uh, you know, he's played third, probably a third baseman, also has played the outfield as well. I, I think he'll be up, you know, first half of the season and an ADP post 500 for, for what he can potentially give you. Uh, I think he's going to be, and especially, you know, he's a good OBP guy as well. Always has been a kind of high walk rate guy, uh, which, which is great to see too. So, yeah, I think he's going to be, you know, when I finish all my NFBC drafts, I I think there's a pretty good chance he's like one of my top 10 you know, highest roster players or something like that. I think I'm going to have a lot of Malloy shares. Nice. Let's go to the Houston Astros here, the team that's gone through many prospects in recent years. What do we have to look forward to this year, Eric? Yeah, it's funny. A lot of the the uh, Houston guys, even the ones that turn out to be, you know, really good players for them on both sides of the ball, outside of like Tucker, uh, Bregman, and Altuve, they weren't like super highly ranked prospects. And I think that's kind of similar case this year, looking at who might come up you know the, the name I look to the most is, is Joey Loprofido. I guess you know played all kind of all over the diamond, some outfield, some first, some second. You know, really good power speed blend uh, as as well. Um, maybe the average won't be super high uh, with him. Maybe he's more of like a 250, 260 guy. But you know, in that ballpark in that lineup, he can get a shot. And you've seen they've kind of churned through some outfielders. You know, Chaz McCormick having a huge breakout year who was like a waiver wire gem for those that added him early in the year or, or even drafted him. Uh, and obviously with, with his ability to play all over the infield and, you know, the guys that, you know, Altuve has had some injury issues, obviously Yordan too. So I, I think you see Loper Fido uh, at, at some points, uh, probably, you know, May, June or so. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where exactly his ADP is. I'm going to pull it up super quick. It, it, oh, 739. Yeah. So you're getting him in like the last you know handful of rounds. Uh, of a uh, DC with what he's capable of offensively and maybe even a guy that can play multiple positions and maybe get that eligibility, which would be sweet. Yeah. I, he's a guy I'm going to have a lot of shares of as well. What about you, Clegg? 
Are we ever going to see Pedro Leon? He's been in AAA three <laughs> straight years. I don't think that's who, nuts. Who, Chris, who graduates off of our prospect spreadsheets first? Pedro Leon or Michael Bush? It's got to be Bush. He's at least debuted. I mean, yeah, that's true. Daggum. I, I, I hope so, but the Dodgers just. I don't know if he like kicked someone's dog, you know, had, you know, there has some photos of, I don't know, like what's going on. You know, it's bad when I have Bush on the list later on because he's still technically sitting down there. Yep. Yep. Uh, sure is. I mean, Leon went 21 21 last year, home run stolen bases in AAA. Yeah, he hit 244, but he had a 343 OBP, always been a higher OBP guy, um, good walk rates throughout the minor league career. I, I'm not sure he's a viable fantasy impact. But there are a couple arms, like in the case where they do need some arms. They have a lefty in Colton Gordon, who had a really solid year, and also a righty in Spencer Arigetti, both who are a little bit older. Gordon will be 25, and Arigetti will be 24 soon. And those guys have the experience and have the potential, I believe, to pitch the rotation. Arigetti had some regression in AAA. Especially with the walks, they you know, he was a nine percent walk rate in Double A with a thirty one percent K rate. Jumps to Triple A, goes down to twenty three percent K and a thirteen percent walk. So obviously, not what you want to see there. But I still believe in that arsenal in the ability to pitch in that rotation. And Colton Gordon, while not as big of a strikeout guy, also is another one where I think could be up. Gives him another lefty arm if they need it, and think there's some potential there. He's more of a pitchability command guy with with a solid arsenal all around. All right, let's go to Kansas City Royals, another team that they got a bunch of young players, but are they fantasy viable is the question. So what do you got on this one, Clegg? Uh, that's a I good got Cross's question. answer. If you're watching video, we got Cross's answer. Yeah, you you just <laughs> skip right on through. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's a no. But uh, if I'm digging and finding anybody – I mean, is Michael Garcia? I don't think Michael Garcia. He hasn't qualified anymore. Yeah, I wish. Getting, yeah. He, he's yeah. sneaky good. He is yeah. good. All the I have like top two hundred and fifty in my dynasty rankings. Nobody realizes how good he is, but yep. that's aside the point. Um, just looking down their depth chart, there's not a lot to like. I mean, they sent out a twenty-seven-year-old CJ Alexander to the AFL this year, which was you know. If that says anything about the state, twenty-seven-year-old at the AFL, <laughs> yeah, it, that should tell you what you need to know about the uh, state of the system there. So, I guess Samad Taylor's one to watch. He's kind of a versatile um, infield to outfield type guy where he could play utility role. I have no clue if he's somebody you actually want to invest in. He's got some speed, but really, there's not a lot in the system. I guess there, if there's one that has a good shot, I'd say it's probably Tyler Gentry who had a really good 2022, actually. He's an outfielder. He's a little bit older. He'll be 25 by opening day. But he he followed it up with a AAA performance that was not quite as good, but still runs really high OBPs, ran 370 OBP in a, quote, down year, which he hit 253, had 16 home runs and 14 stolen bases as well. And that was coming off a 2022 when he hit 321 with a 417 OBP and 16 home runs in just 331 double-A plate appearances. So uh, Gentry is kind of a deeper cut target who has a potential to get a crack, but there's not a lot going on in the system. You said no, Eric, but I'll give you the floor if you got anybody. Otherwise, we'll, we'll move on. I mean, I'll just throw out a couple of pitchers. That I, I'm, I don't even think they're even going to be draftable in DTs. I'll just say their names, just throw them out there. Uh, Noah Cameron and David Sandlin. Maybe we see them at some point in that rotation just because it's you know pretty bad rotation still uh, all around, even with the – you know, emergence of uh, Cole Reagans. But yeah, there's uh, not a lot to get excited about this year or even maybe probably the next few years in that system. It's maybe the worst system in baseball. It's in the, it's in the discussion. We go from one not great team to another not great team. Los Angeles, Angels, Anaheim. Eric, I'll let you start with this one. Uh, they might at least have a few more prospects, maybe? You got anything? Mm-hmm. A little bit, a little bit, uh, it's a little better. Uh, not not a lot better, but uh, obviously, you know, Nolan Shenwell uh, came up, you know, re- you know, played like what three games in the minor leagues or something. Uh, came crazy. up and came up. But obviously, he's even one that I think is overrated for for fantasy purposes. Doesn't have like huge power. A good o- good OBP guy, but that's really his calling card there. So I'm not really one I'd be excited about drafting uh, at at all. Really, unless he kind of went super late. A couple of their names that uh, I could see get some run. You know, one already did. You know, Trey Cabbage. You know, I want to see like a, kind of what this Angels roster looks like in a couple of months, and you know, see see if you know. I don't think they're going to trade Trout, but if they do, that'll open up another spot. 
for Cabbage, who actually had a really, a really good season in the upper minors, one of those older prospects. He's already 26. But uh, I said to him, you know, maybe you know Ben Joyce can get some some run in, in that bullpen. Obviously, a guy that, that throws really hard. <sighs> There's really not a lot else outside <laughs> of that, though. A lot of their top guys are, are more so 2025, 2026 ETAs. You know, guys like you know Nelson Rada, Caden Dana, and then those types. But yeah, not, not a not a lot of excitement outside of those couple of names that are, aren't even that exciting. More so, like seven hundred plus pick range. Similar feelings, Clegg. I got someone else. Yeah, the only pitcher I'd highlight is uh, Davis Daniel. Oh, who yes. we, yep. he saw come up last year and pitched twelve innings and twelve decent innings at that. Um, he's an interesting one. He's an older arm. But he looked really good in the AFL, actually. And while he's not a big strikeout guy, I think there's enough there at least to put him in the rotation and be uh, semi-viable, at least, for uh, a deeper pick. His 2023 was pretty inconsistent. He dealt with a lot of injuries, which is why he was in the AFL. Um, but I think he was the only pitcher in the fall league to get have a 10-strikeout game. And it came against uh, Peoria's really good line, if I'm not mistaken. So... Daniel's a deep cut. I don't know where his ADP sits, but he oh, may be one know. just because there's availability. I mean, who else is going to pitch in this rotation? The team is hot garbage. So I take a shot on Daniel getting a, a rotation spot. <laughs> 692. So yeah. Easily free. investment there. Yep. All right. Let's go to the Minnesota Twins. They have a few options that you could, we could discuss. You know, Austin Martin's a topic of conversation. Brooks Lee, uh, Simeon Woods Richardson with his arm. Uh, Clay, what do you got on this Twins situation? The Twins have a weird situation where they have a lot of the same mold of guys. Like, you're Matt Walner. Like, they have injury-riddled guys that are <laughs> all like Matt Walner and Alex Kirilov and Trevor Larnick. Like, all these similar molds, which is um, kind of they weird. type, as they say. <laughs> yeah. It is what it is. Uh, mm-hmm. Louis Varlin no longer a prospect, but somebody that I do like. Um, I really have no interest in Austin Martin or Simeon Woods Richardson. I actually had a scout tell me, that Simeon Woods Richardson was the worst upper upper levels minor pitcher he had ever seen. Like he was wow. that bad. That's, wow, that's, that's a hard. bold statement. Yeah, that's, that's a bold statement. Yeah, that's harsh. That's yeah. it's very harsh. So he's got a family, man. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who it was, it was behind the scenes. So. I know. I'm just joking. I, I've I've met his family. I I've met uh, his dad. Oh, he was pitching in Double A. He was in the bullpen. I was going on to take video, and this you know, older gentleman was next to me. We started chatting it up, and it was his father. It was just kind of like one of those random things, but. Don't yeah, tell him I said that. Yeah, hopefully oh, you didn't say it. I Someone say told it. you that. There's a difference. Yep, that's true. <laughs> uh, Brooks Lee's a solid investment where I'm not sure what else he has left to prove. I mean, he's a high hit tool guy. You can look past the numbers in AAA last year. He's a, a very solid hitter with some decent pop. Like he's not going to wow you, but as a deeper league target, I think Brooks Lee is a solid investment. And I think on the mound side, I think that. David Festa is the one that I'm going to look to invest in. Um, Really big guy with a strong arsenal, uh, 23 years old. And while the numbers didn't really jump off the page at you last year, he's one that pitched so much better than like the numbers like actually indicated. Ran super high Babbitt, uh, a really low strand rate, like a lot of bad luck against him. And the arsenal, I think, is just incredible with Festa. And he's got the starter build that you want to see. So, I'm going to invest in Festa. He may be a, a mid-season call-up, but he's one of those late guys that you can kind of sit on where he's probably in line to get a shot because he's better than everybody else at the upper level of the minors in this org. And so when the time comes and when there's openings, why not try Festa? So he's one that I'd look at. What about you, Eric? Yeah, the only name I'll add here, uh, Junior Severino. Uh, got had a lot of power, upper minors. I think yeah, 35 home runs uh, this year between double A and triple A. But, you know, played a little bit of second, a little bit of third. And I think just with, you know, all the injury prone guys that the, the twins have, obviously, you know, Royce Lewis, hopefully his knee, hopefully his knee can hold up. It's obviously going to be great to see a full season out of him. But, you know, and obviously Buxton can't stay healthy. So I think you could see him wriggle his way into some, some playing time here at some point in the season. I think he's a guy that, you know, if they wanted to, he probably could, you know, debut early in the year, but not a, really a spot for him. But he's a guy that the power will be what he provides. Like, not a guy that's going to run at all. And the average won't be terrible, but not not a guy that's going to be a you know, high average guy either. Probably 
on the lower end of the spectrum. But if you're looking for some cheap power late that guy that could you know work his way into playing time due to all those injuries. I I looked, he's been taking him one out of 19 DC so far, and it was like 719 or whatever it was. So late round dart throw, you know, maybe look look his way. All righty. Let's go to the Bronx, to the New York Yankees. So we saw some of the guys, Volpe and Peraza and company last year. Uh, we even saw a catching situation maybe changing in New York. So, Eric, what do you have on potential Yankees prospects? And we finally get to a, a really exciting uh, potential uh, system here in 2024. And obviously you, they'll get Jason Dominguez back at some point uh, in you know May, June, whatever it's going to be. Uh, obviously, you know he's a big man. Everyone knows him for what he did when he came up. Um, but there's a lot of other potential impact players here too. Like I, I like Austin Wells uh, a good amount. You know, he's got that solid left-handed power at Yankee Stadium, which you love to see. I think you see Spencer Jones at, at some point this year. Still kind of trying to figure out what he's going to be. Like he's shown all the ingredients to be a, a, a big impact player, but also has some warts in the profile as well. Obviously, a bigger guy too, so you know, that usually can get exploited by good pitchers. But we'll see. Uh, but he's a, a fun guy, you know, uh, upside pl- play there. And then, you know, Ben Rice, too. I, I think Ben Rice is going to have, you know, carve out a role this year. I, I don't know if it's going to be a catcher, first base, a little bit of both. Uh, but he's a guy that's still getting slept on. Like, I have him as a top 100 prospect right now. He, once you get caught up to double A, uh, middle of the season, he was the best hitter in the double A Eastern League. And it wasn't particularly close down the stretch. So, a guy that I think will come up uh, at some point this summer, uh, seeing what capacity and then pitching side of things you got drew thorpe you got chase hampton more so you know drew thorpe's the i think the bigger name the more polished name there so thorpe's a guy i'm gonna try to get a lot of shares of i, I saw him pitch and even though it wasn't a great start out of him you know, it's i could tell like, this is gonna be like a really not maybe not a stud but just a really good starter for a really long time guy that'll keep his ratios in check give you some strikeouts keep the walk rate down low i like drew thorpe a lot and obviously the yankees Obviously, we'll see what they do this offseason. They're the Yankees, so they obviously can go out and have a berserk offseason. But there's a lot of holes in that rotation right now. And I think Drew Thorpe could be a guy that fills one of those holes sooner rather than later. Awesome. Chris, what do you got on us, the Yankees? Yeah, I think – I'll just say I think Ben Rice is better than Austin Wells. So throw that I, out yeah, there. I can see um, it, yeah. I, I mean, Wells ain't going to stick a catcher. And, and Rice may not either, but – the only thing that Wells has going for him is a short porch in Yankee Stadium. He's a lefty. That's that's kind of it. Uh, Rice is also a lefty, so it balances out. I think Rice is a better hitter personally, and all the underlying data kind of suggests that too. Um, my pitcher will be a little different. I'll go with uh, Will Warren. He was, mm-hmm. stuff plus-wise, the best pitcher in AAA last year. 123 stuff plus, a 107 pitching plus. Uh, he doesn't allow any hard contact, had a 3% barrel rate against last year a 30% CSW. And while he went through some bumps along the way, he finished out the year over his final six starts, 35 innings, a 1.82 ERA and 36 Ks. Um, I know that Ham- uh, that uh, you're looking at, obviously, Chase Hampton and, and Drew Thorpe as the flashy guys, but Warren metrically is better than both of them, and he's got the arsenal to back it up. I don't think Thorpe's fastball is going to play in the majors. It's just low 90s with without much movement that, that – the changeup's devastating. The changeup can get away. Like good changeups dominate lower level hitters. So I like Thorpe, but I think Warren's the better pitcher. I think that he's closer because we saw him in AAA uh, pretty much all season last year. Actually, yeah, majority of the season he wasn't 100 innings in AAA. So he's ready. I think he's probably the first one that gets the crack. Nice. Uh, Thorpe's 515, Warren 531. So both going pretty close to each other in DCs. Clay, let's go to the Oakland Athletics. We saw a bunch of them get called up this past year. They have no reason not to call players up because they're cheap, and the A's are cheap. So what do you got on Oakland? They suck. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> it's very true. They're. Uh, it's funny because it's a system that has like consistently traded for guys, but somehow like doesn't feel like it's gotten like a you ton better. You mean yeah. the, the, the front office doesn't trade for the right guys, you mean? Yeah. Oh, surprised. <laughs> Yeah, Uh, so I think that, like, Daryl Hernays is somebody to watch. He's an interesting, like, deeper cut prospect where um, he's not, like, super flashy. Um, He's kind of a hit tool first guy that doesn't offer a ton of counting stats, but he's probably one that gets a crack. So if you're looking for, like, some late bagging average and not much else, then maybe Hernays is the guy you want to invest in, but not somebody that I'm particularly looking 
to draft, but I think he probably gets the the first crack. Um, a couple of like deeper cuts, obviously like Lawrence Butler, we saw get some time. I'm not sure. I don't think he technically graduated. I'm um, on service time. I know his plate appearances were under the threshold, but we saw Lawrence Butler come up. There was inconsistencies, but he's got a ton of power and some good speed as well. Um, some others, I. I wouldn't rule out Joey Estes being a solid starter. He came over in the Braves trade, and he was really good in Double A last year. Three two eight ERA and a one one zero WHIP. He's not a big strikeout guy, but he's a high command guy. He got hit around a little bit in Triple A, but that hitter environment is is. I mean, pitchers don't want to pitch in the PCL, obviously. But I think Estes is kind of like above average fastball changeup slider across the board. So maybe he's like a super deep league guy who did already get some major league uh, innings. He got 10 major league innings last year. So maybe just maybe they give him a shot at some uh, rotation time, depending on the health of these guys. I mean, you look at their rotation, it's, it's not enthralling at all. And I'm in the camp that I don't believe Mason Miller can handle a starter's workload. He never has, and he's been highly injury prone. And so like, I'm kind of staying out of on Mason Miller at the cost because I think everybody's going berserk on him and thinks he can be, Elite, which he has the upside to be, but he's just never handled a starter's workload, so I'm not investing in Mason Miller. Yeah, the Mason Miller ADP of 273 is still too rich for me. Yep. Um, Eric, you got anything on the Oakland A's? No, not not really a whole lot to add here. You know, all, all the names you know, Clegg already mentioned, Daryl Hernandez, Denzel Clark. Those are like the, the intriguing names, and I I like Mason Miller. Obviously, the stuff is really good, but yeah, okay. it's. Remains to be seen if he can even handle 100 innings, let alone like 150 plus. So, I think he's going to really pucker out. I, th- I think so, yep. and I think there's a lot of similarities there. Obviously, you know, super elite stuff, durability issues. I can see him being this like a lights out bullpen arm. So maybe that maybe he's you know one of the better closers in baseball in, in a few years. Yep. We'll see, but yeah, n- not a whole lot. Yeah, it, it, what you know, what you said in, in the beginning. It's funny that the system's just after trading all their big names is still. A bottom, <laughs> still bad. bottom, t- bottom ten is probably putting it nicely, but it's funny. Like in that Sean Murphy trade, it would have it would have been a lot better if they got like you know I don't know William Contreras in that hmm. deal. And yeah, they got Ruiz. I'm who, glad they didn't. Who, who yes. gets a lot, a lot of, a lot of steals for you? But Ruiz is just not a good ball player in general. No. So it's like they've got like all the you know the Braves are like oh hey we have like all this depth we don't need these guys whatsoever here have them all. Yeah. And that's a, that's been the Oakland's MO, and, and more than just that deal, every deal they've ever done, it's just a lot of meh players that yeah. don't excite anybody. It, the A's like quantity over quality. That's oh, kind absolutely. of their thing. So that's been a, a faux pas of theirs. But let's go to a team that likes to trade and trades pretty well in the Seattle Mariners. And Eric, I'll, I'll lead you here. I know Ryan Bliss is a popular name out there, but what are you seeing with the Mariners? Yeah, a couple of names here uh, potentially with the Mariners. Obviously, Bliss had uh, went berserk this year. Uh, most of that was in the Arizona system for that trade for uh, uh, who was it? Oja Rojas in that in that trade. And I obviously don't think he's you know going to be a stud like he was showing, but there is you know some fantasy friendly skill set in, in, in Bliss's profile. He's he's got a little bit of pop. He's you know a good athlete can steal some bags. Uh, so I think definitely could see him at some point, you know, maybe mid season. Um, but the other name, there's no names that I think are going to be up early. A, a lot of, a lot of their top guys are. You know, guys that are a couple of years away, like you know, Lazaro Montez, Cole Emerson, guys like that. Uh, but I do see, think you see Tyrell Locklear at some point this year. You know, corner infield guy. You know, good bat, solid power too. Um, I think you see him maybe second half of the year. But he even he's a guy that I wouldn't take outside of the last round or two uh, in, in a DC. But it's really him, uh, him and Bliss. We saw Emerson Hancock debut uh, in the second half of last year. Not super excited. He's kind of like a Quinn Priester to me, where it's like, yeah, he'll give you some innings, but are they going to be useful innings? Probably not. Um, but yeah, I think those are really the guys to look for. And even again, those aren't going to be names you're looking at, you know, outside of the last round or two. What about you, Clegg? Anybody else? Yeah, the only one I'll add that has a shot is like a Jonathan Class A just for speed. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, I mean, he stole 62 bags, or actually 62 just was in double A. So you combine those two, and that was 79 stolen bases. He hit 20 home runs as well last year. And I know the hit tool, there's hit tool concerns. Does he actually get to that kind of power? Was it playing up in the Texas League? Absolutely. But 
if you're looking for like a deep cut source of speed, there's a chance that class A is up by mid season and gives you some valuable steals. And you know, it's kind of like the Sedan so Raffaella effect where he came up and was valuable. And I think that's the kind of effect class A could have, but yeah, most of our top guys are in on the, uh, the lower levels and probably not up in 2023 or 2024, excuse me. All right, let's talk about a team in the AL East that had, usually has a pretty good farm system, and they develop too many players have to trade them at some point in time. Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, Clay, why don't you run with this one? I mean, everybody knows uh, Junior Caminero. He's elite. I mean, he's the best prospect in baseball, in my opinion. Massive power. I think you see him up on opening day. There's no reason to not when they brought him up down the stretch last year. There's some other names. Uh, I know Jonathan Aranda's like technically graduated. But if he can somehow find a fit, the bat's really, really good. There's some solid underlying data here. Um, you mean with Amer- American League Michael Bush? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> is what it feels like, yes. He's 25 and a half. So, I mean, he is uh, – they have a lot of guys like that. I mean, just looking down their board, like Greg Jones, he's – feels like he's been there forever cameron meisner like austin austin shenton shenton yeah i mean there's just no spots for these guys ultimately uh the one deeper cut pitcher is mason montgomery who like i'm not even not overly enamored with the fastball velo is just like really is low 90s and like typically is hard to excel you see a lot of these guys excel with plus changeups at the lower levels and especially when it's a lefty doing it like mason montgomery or he was really dominant in 2022 in high A and double A. Um, he was fine in double A last year, but then he was solid down the stretch with four triple A starts to end the year. Um, but he's not going to be a big strikeout guy. The command is kind of his his thing, but yet he still walked a good bit of batters last year. But if anybody can figure it out, it's going to be the Rays. And so Mason Montgomery is a lefty that has a shot in this very injury prone rotation. What about you, Eric? Yeah, outside of the the names Clegg already mentioned, I mean, I think Austin Shenton's, I think, a decent late round uh, dart throw in a DC. I wouldn't take him, you know, earlier than like around 45 or so, but he's a guy that had a really underrated year in the upper minors. And I mean, maybe we see him uh, for a, a portion of 2024. And then um, Carson Williams, uh, an- another name that is, uh, you know, a fantasy friendly, you know, profile, you know, power speed guy, really good defender. Like, I think he's their shortstop of the future. You know, assuming we don't see, you know, Wander Franco uh, play for this team again. Um, I think, obviously, very good, def- you know, very good defensive shortstop. And, you know, if he can make, you know, keep the K rate in check and, and make enough contact, I think he's going to be a pretty fun fantasy player. More so, a guy you'll probably see the second half of the year. Like, I don't think he's up for, you know, July or so. Um, so, another name, just like one of those late round upside targets so that I think we'll see at some point this year. All right, let's go to the Texas Rangers here. We saw Evan Carter come up towards the end of last season, have his impact. White Langford um, is already like heating up the streets, like I mentioned earlier on here. He's got a, an ADP of, goodness gracious, 137 right now. Uh, Owen White is another name. So, Eric, why don't you start off with the Rangers system here? Yeah, I'm so glad that uh, I got to ra- start off with the Rangers series. I, I love this. This is one of my favorite orgs in, in baseball right now. So, so many fun players to talk about. And, like, we're talking about going back to what you're talking about earlier about, uh, you know, not wanting to go on prospects early. If I'm going on one prospect early, it's going to be Wyatt Langford. I, I already, I've been, I've done one DC so far. I already got Wyatt Langford secured. I'm going to have a lot of shares of Wyatt Langford. I think he's up, if not opening day, shortly thereafter, you know, stud profile all around. Just love it. You know, power, speed, contact, approach. It's all there. Love Wyatt Langford. And just the fact that, they just won the World Series, and they're going to have a full year of Carter. You know, get you know a full year, or close to a full year of Langford added to that lineup, which was already a top three lineup. That's just not fair. Uh, a couple other names here. Uh, I think you could see Abimelech Ortiz. Uh, Abimelech Ortiz, excuse me, at some point. Uh, you know, really good power bats. Uh, you know, first base. Uh, maybe we see him later on in the season. Uh, I won't sleep on like a Justin Foscue, a guy that's kind of almost getting into Michael Bush, Jonathan Aranda territory. Uh, I've got this had a you know, pretty good minor league you know, track, track record, but just can't break in to that lineup. I'm going to play the second, second base, some outfield. Um, I'm not really intrigued a whole lot by Owen White. You know, he took a step back uh, last year, but 
you know, again, he kind of falls into that Hancock, you know, um, Quinn Priester range where he'll probably use some innings, but I'm not sure how great those innings are. But, but the last one here and, and credit to, to Clegg here, because you know, he was on, you know, this train in the beginning and I'll let him uh, kind of talk more about this guy, but Emiliano Teodo is just absolutely freaking electric. I, I don't know what it's going to look like. Cause it's like, it's an experience watching him. And we saw that in the AFL where he had, it was like 22 pitches, like six of them are strikes. And he, I think he hit two guys, had two wild pitches, but like guy throws a hundred plus, you know, great slider. So maybe he works his way into that, you know, some late inning um, or late innings and get some saves later on in the year. But he's just a name to kind of keep on your radar. All right, Clegg, the floor is yours for Mr. Emiliano Teodo. Yeah, Teodo's got elite stuff and he pitches a starter all season. And there was a closer in the AFL, which I think is kind of an indication of uh, where he's going long term. And er that writing was kind of on the wall, but I just happened to catch him in late April. They were here in Greenville and up seeing him three times this year. But he's like 99 to 102 on the fastball. He has a change up at 94. Like literally, he threw the change up and I had to look at the scalp side of me and was like, was that just a change up? He threw it 94. <laughs> and we were both kind of like, holy crap. Like, and his sliders, uh, upper 80s into the 90 range. The stuff is certainly reminiscent of an elite closer. And the command comes and goes. Like, prior to the Fall Stars star, uh, appearance, he'd only walked like one guy the entire yeah. AFL. Right. He allowed zero earned runs, two hits, one walk over like 10 innings with like 20 strikeouts. And then in the Fall Stars, it was just like, poof, just like an explosion. <laughs> it blew up. But um, yeah, Toyota's stuff is certainly going to play in the bullpen. There's just not a lot of openings on this roster right now for any of these prospects. Like Foskey would be the name that I'd love to say gets a spot, but where does he fit? I think he's trade bait. Foskey's a really good player, but I think Langford is probably in the opening day lineup just based on what my gut's telling me, what they did with him down the stretch. Like he was a legit candidate to join the team when Adelise Garcia went down the World Series. Like he was there ready to go if they called on him. So that tells you how they viewed him. And that makes me think he's going to be in the MPD lineup as long as he has a good spring training. Sweet. Let's round out the American League with the Toronto Blue Jays. We saw, oh man, at the Derby, it was great. Paul, Mag Paul Magiani. Was Paul Magiani. Yeah. Paul Magiani. Yeah. We saw him put on his show at third base, but hitting bombs in the Derby. That was fun, especially when you have DiPietro and the rest of the Italian Mafia behind me. <laughs> they had a blast with that one. Um, we, you, you mentioned Ricky Tiedemann earlier. I was kind of bummed. I get it. He, Pitched early in the AFL, gone because they just want to get his innings. Makes sense. Some other kind of maybe fun names in, in this one. Addison Berger, potentially. Maybe that's why Bichette's getting discussed around. Who knows? So, Clay, what do you have on this Toronto system, which uh, might actually have some, some options in DCs? They do have a lot of options, and it's kind of weird to think like they may trade Bichette. But... Yeah, when I saw that, Bichette and Vlad are getting discussed in trades right now. I'm like, wow. But then you look at their system, I'm like, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which would create openings. I mean, right now, like assuming I'm assuming Matt Chapman does not go back. To no, the, no, I think he's long gone. He's long gone. So that opens up a spot at third base. It's not Kevin Biggio's spot. I do believe it's Paul Magiani's spot to lose right now. If they want to go that route, I think he's he's ready and I think he's better than than Biggio and what Biggio has to offer. We saw that last year. We saw it in the FL. He's really solid. But also you have Addison Barger, who you mentioned, who I was a little bit shocked that didn't get caught up last year down the stretch where I thought he could have contributed. I know he missed some time with injury, but he was really good. He's a lefty bat. He's versatile too, which helps them. He plays short, third. He plays outfield. So Barger may be one that's a good investment too. But I think that Orlovis Martinez may be the sneaky one for power where I was pretty out on Martinez prior to last year. Just been a power bat with nothing else. But I will say that he developed some contact skills this year and was actually respectable on the contact side. We saw him get to AAA. He was good all season. So they have options here. Or Elvis Martinez, they have Addison Barger. They've got Damiano Palmigiani. So there's options for them to fill out this lineup pending that they do make some trades. And while the rotation does look fairly set, I mean, there's talks of Manoa being traded. And... We know how bad Manoa was, so who's to say he even has a spot in the rotation to begin with? I, I said it earlier. I'll say it again. I think Tiedemann's in the rotation on day one if he's healthy. 
There's serious it makes injury. sense of what you're saying. Why? Like you got to get his arm in there. There's serious long-term injury concerns. Like what he what he's been dealing with surgery just doesn't magically fix. And so while he's healthy, I think they're gonna pop him in and see what he can do. I mean, he he was healthy in the AFL, threw 75 pitches, several starts, completed five innings multiple times for the first time since June of 2022. So I think they're going to put him in the rotation and just roll with it if he's healthy out of spring training. What do you got, Eric? It's a, it's, that was a fun one to wrap up the A on. Yeah, no, and I, I think Tiedemann is the poster child for, you know, don't waste the bullets that we talked about earlier. Like, literally, he is the – if you had to write, write an article, you'd probably use him as the picture uh, for the article. Uh, and, I, and I love Tiedemann. I think he obviously – you know, in the discussion for, you know, you know, best pitching project in the minor leagues, definitely in, in that top tier. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of sneaky, like, there's not a lot of big names, but there's a lot of sneaky guys, you know, like, you know, Chris mentioned, you know, Barger, Erlis Martinez, obviously, Pomigiani is super underrated, really solid bats. The only other name, you know, that maybe sneaks into some, some value here, especially if, if they start trading enough guys, which I don't see why they would want, even with their, you know, uh, system not being the greatest. It's not bad, but why would you want to trade like young stud guys like Bichette and flat? It just, it baffles probably, me. probably know they're not gonna be able to pay for him pretty soon. So go get yeah, some stuff. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's just a financial, you know, thing. Yeah. I don't know. But if, and if they do trade Vlad and you, maybe you see some Spencer Horowitz, uh, again, yeah. not like super intriguing, but you know, maybe he's a guy that could, you know, carve out some value if he, if he gets enough, uh, enough plate appearances, especially if there's a, a trade or two. To, to be made, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of sneaky guys you can get in your the last like handful of rounds. Yeah, and Palma Gianni, Barger, and Martinez, the three bats you mentioned, anywhere from 630 to 715 for those three. So all late, yeah. late round targets, which could be pretty darn fun. All right, let's go to the National League here. Arizona Diamondbacks. You guys mentioned Jordan Lawler earlier on the show. I've already been in a Reddit discussion. Tell me I'm a fool for my thoughts on Jordan Lawler. So that's fun, but that's Reddit for you. Blaze Alexander is a popular name. We know they have a very deep system. I just don't know how fast they're going to move these guys. That's why you're here. Eric, you can start with the D-backs for us. Wait, so what was your position on, on Lawler? Are you pro Lawler? Well, first, the guy you? admitted he couldn't read my rankings where I said the like, bottom four guys are all prospects. I said if I can get better reads on their, you know, if they're going to play, I'll move them up, obviously. But right now in November, this is where they're ranked. And I said Perdomo is the shortstop. They love his glove out there, and he proved enough to keep the job. Lawler would have to go to third, and the guy told me I was a fool. No, it, I, think, I think you were kind of spot on. <laughs> he was and a season ticket holder, so he saw him every day, so he knows, he said. Right. No, I, I, and I absolutely love Lawler, but the fact that you know, they have Perdomo there as well, and also you know them adding a Eugenio Suarez yep. recently kind of complicates things. Like I yep. was super in. On, I'm still am long term. I think he's gonna be an absolute stud, uh, Jordan Lawler. But you know, maybe they send him back down to AAA for a little bit. ADP is around 250 right now in DCs, which I thought was great. Uh, as, as I think he could be a, a 15, 20 guy right off the bat. Uh, he looked like he was, you know, after a slow start, he absolutely tore it up the final, you know, I think three and a half months before his uh, early September call up to Arizona. So I, I think you want to see how that kind of situation, you know, plays out on the left side of the infield. If it looks like he's going to be a starter, like over Perdomo or whatever, or if they have Suarez DH a lot more, I don't know. Um, I'd still be willing to take him. I think there's potential impact uh, right away uh, with Lawler. Um, and then outside outside of uh, him, you know, there's like because there's a lot of guys that are coming up maybe 2025. Um, you, maybe, you know, some Dominic Fletcher, obviously he came up a little bit. Maybe you see some Jorge Barosa. Uh, I think he could come up. Maybe A.J. Vukovic. You know, but I'm not sure if these guys are because you're even looking the draft in DCs, and if they are, probably really late. Ivan Melendez, I don't think so. Uh, he, he probably comes up at some point, but there's so much swing and miss in the profile that I I don't think it's gonna be worth it. And a lot of the other guys are, you know, more so 2025 20, and beyond. All, all their good arms have been called up. Uh, they have some other guys. I just don't think they'll a be up long enough or b make enough impact or combination of the two. So, yeah, I, I think it's uh, you're looking at Lawler and maybe some Fletcher Barossa. That's what, kind of what we're looking at here. What about you, Clegg? Anything else? Yeah, Barossa's interesting. I'm, I'm writing up the d back system right now, and I learned that he was 5'5". Five, five. He was always listed at 5'9", until they had to remeasure guys for we'll the... Uh, shoes off. 
Yeah, so they had to remeasure everybody for the uh, um, ABS system at AAA. And apparently he's not even fi- quite 5'5". Five, five. Like, apparently oh, he's like 5'4 and a half. So I, that kind of made me, like, back off him a little bit. He's a high-contact guy with, like, minimal power and some decent speed. But, like, can you actually play in the MLB at 5'4"? I mean, like, honestly. It's tricky. Like, yeah. Ask Jose Altuve. Yeah. He's at least, like, 5'6". I, know, six, I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I Melendez, I don't think is good. Like I'm just not in on Ivan Melendez at all. Um, he's got power, but nothing else. He swings at some really bad pitches. Um, Andre Shaparo is interesting. He came over. He they got him just a couple weeks ago. I don't remember if they just picked him up. I think they just picked him up off the like the Yankees waved him and they picked him up. Um, the last two seasons, he hit 25 home runs this year in AAA with the Yankees. Hit 247 with a 331 OBP. And the year before, he hit 19 home runs in 271 double A plate appearances, which was incredible to see. Hit 289 there. Um, so he's pretty interesting, actually, where I think Shaparo may be one where he may get some sneaky run and is somebody that no one's really in on at all. But yeah, I agree for the most part. A lot of the people in this system are that are good are a little bit further away and the arms aren't super intriguing. All right, well, real, we'll go back. Sorry, real yeah. quick addition. Sorry, uh, Bubba, cut you off. I was just okay. looking at the shortest players in MLB history, and outside of the, the publicity son of Eddie Guidel, who was like three foot seven, the uh, I don't know how valid this is, but um, the shortest I'm seeing is a guy named Stubby Magner, which is a great <laughs> name. That's a good name. He, good he name was, he so. was a five foot three, and then there's some guy named Pompeo Yo Yo Davalillo, which is another. Is this a Savannah name. Bananas opponent? I don't know. And then you got a uh, Wee Willie Ke- a Wee Willie Keeler. Oh, uh, so these guys are like five, th- oh, five, three, Vince. five, four. Yeah, these these are some great names. What's the next uh, name? Yeah, I know. Uh, Let's keep them coming. Oh, oh wait. Okay, here we go. Rabbit Moranville. Oh my uh, goodness. Five five. Bobby Shantz. Uh, they boring. must have all played when they shared gloves, like left them in the outfields. <laughs> my guess. These aren't real players. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, Hack Wilson who has the all-time single-season RBI record at, like, 190, whatever, was only 5'6". Interesting. Wow. So he's getting towards yeah. Altuve Pedroia range. Yep, and then you got Phil Rizzuto, Joe Sewell, Billy Hamilton, not, you know, the one from recently, the one, like, 130 years ago. <laughs> and then you get Jose Altuve at 12th shortest. So, that's yeah, not, not many that are... Some like, of those names, like, that's, you know, politician or baseball player. Yeah. That's, that's fun <laughs> stuff right there. <laughs> Um, all right, Clegg, I'll let you roll with your Atlanta Braves here who, you know, they already have everybody, you know, signed for the next 15 years and <laughs> they're trading away what people might think are young players to call up soon for like to free up roster spots. So is there anything we can actually expect from the Braves prospects this year? <laughs> I think the only openings are potentially for pitchers at this point. There's not a lot in the pipeline that are of hitters that are ready and they don't need hitters anyway, but I think. You know, the two big names, A.J. smith Shaver, who we saw debut. And then they have Hurston Waldrop, who they took in the first round last year, who made AAA, and there was rumors of him being called up the last week of the season to the majors. That didn't happen. But both those guys have a good chance. People like to crap on A.J. smith Shaver for some reason, but he came up and struggled. But the dude was 20, and he was pitching in high A to begin the season. He literally has turned 21 last week and was – Absolutely incredible throughout the minors and even in the majors. I mean, it was still respectable, all things considered. I mean, he ran a 4.26 ERA and a 111 whip, and he was putting some pretty bad spots at that. But Smith Schalber's arsenal, I think, is better than people give him credit for, too. The fastball at its best is a plus pitch, um, 95, 96 up in the zone when I saw him. Uh, he was sitting like, 16 to 18 inches of IVB. So pretty, it plays best up in the zone. The slider's a plus pitch. He had the curveball back in the arsenal this year, which 60 plus inches of downward movement, really good pitch. I think the changeup's an average pitch as well. So when the command is there, he's really good. And I'm not particularly worried. Everybody's like, sell him. He sucks. Like, oh, he's been exposed. Like, I think those takes are pretty bad, honestly, from somebody that's watched him at multiple levels in the minors and I'll tell you the org doesn't feel that way at all about him. If the Braves do trade for a big starting pitcher, he's probably going to be included. Like he's one that are only like big time prospects, but with Hurston Waldrop, it's a similar case where uh, Waldrop's just got stuff for days. 
Can he harness it? I think is the question. And I think he can. I think Waldrop was hurt a bit like this year at Florida because he was just throwing the splitter so much that teams were just sitting on it. Like they knew that that's what he was doing. And so he was getting away with that against most teams, but good SEC opponents were hitting that. His fastball this year ranged in the pros from 93 to 97. So it fluctuated. He threw enough strikes to, to be a starter. The splitter is probably the arguably one of the it was the best pitch in the draft, in my opinion, of any drafty last year. And it will probably be one of the best splitters like of anybody that comes up and just performs. Uh, he looked so good with that last year. He throws it a lot. It's 85, 89. And the slider, too, I think is a pretty serviceable pitch in a similar velocity band. So I think that maybe is the concern that he has just two velocity bands. So maybe there's a way you can add a cutter in there that like is a low 90s pitch to kind of um, bridge that gap between the fastball and the splitter slider. But the arsenal is really good with, with Waldrop. And I'd hate to see either leave for uh, Dylan Cease. Like, I just don't love Dylan Cease <laughs> enough to make a trade like that, honestly. Don't blame me at all. <laughs> yeah, uh, AJ Spishaver, 350, 380 P seems pretty nice, actually, all things considered. Uh, Eric, you got anything on the Atlanta Braves? No, not really. Not really. Like, yeah. Clegg obviously nailed it, being his team. Yeah, it, it, but it's funny, though, how people, like, don't really want Dylan Cease. I thought yeah. that same thing with the Red Sox. They're like, they're like, oh, we just give up bail. I'm like, no, absolutely not. Yeah. It's we have from guy that was considered. I like, wouldn't even know, allow that. And I'm, you yeah, mm-hmm. leave yeah. bail alone. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, I I love bail. I saw him a ton. Like, leave leave him in this system. Yeah, but yeah, outside of you know the names that Clegg mentioned, like there's really not much. Maybe you see David McCabe come up. I don't know, just another name. But obviously, that would take a few injuries for that to happen. But yeah, it's really just those, those couple arms that he mentioned. All right, let's go to the Chicago Cubs, where there are interesting names. Pete Crow Armstrong got a cup of coffee. Maybe he gets more run. James Triantos, you guys talked to in Arizona. He won, I believe, the MVP in Arizona Fall League. Um, you know, Brennan Davis is a popular name last year. They got pitchers in Brown. They have Horton. They have they got options. So, Eric, why don't we start with you on the Chicago Cubs? Yeah, there, there's a lot of intrigue here with, with the Cubs this year. Yeah, I think Pete Crow Armstrong is going to get play a lot – um, they don't have him in the starting lineup right now, but is, is Mike Touchman going to be their starting center fielder all year? No, he that's not, not that's be. not going to happen. No, <laughs> that's absolutely not going to happen. Maybe at first. So maybe PCA goes back to the AAA for a little bit, kind of similar to Lawler. Uh, I think that could be a similar kind of timeline for each of those guys, but he's going to be up. He's going to be up a lot and he's going to make an impact, you know, power speed guy hit for a decent enough average. I, I think he's a guy that absolutely uh, taking your, in your DCs and we'll see where his ADP is three nineteen. I think that's fair. I mean, uh, it's about 70 picks later than Lawler was going. So I, th- I think that's a, a fine ADP. It, it might drop a little bit if he's not going to be looking like the starter. I and mean, maybe you can take advantage of that. But outside of him, I, I think you see a healthy dose of Kate Horton, at least for half a season. He's not another guy you know, in the discussion uh, for top pitching prospect in baseball. Definitely a tier one guy. And then you're going to see some uh, probably some Owen Casey at some point this year. Maybe some Matt Shaw. Uh, you know, very advanced collegiate bat, one of the better bats in this past draft class. That's moving quickly already at the double A uh, this this past year. So I think you could see him second half of the year. A guy that can play both middle infield spots. Maybe you see some you know, Trianto, some Alexander Canario. I think Jordan Wicks. I think it's lost in the shuffle because he's not like That's a true. super sexy prospect name. But like I, I've been trying to get Wicks everywhere. His ADP is four fifty eight. I like the Wicks call a lot, actually. Yeah, like he, and he came up and, and showed some pretty solid stuff. Like, is he again super flashy? Is he be a stud? No. Good again, back of the bullpen. Yeah, he he screams number four starter than me. He screams it. But yeah, sure. you know, does he is he in the rotation start of the year? We'll see. But uh, I think he, he gets in enough starts this year um, to to warrant taking kind of where he was going in that four fifty range. Perfect. What about you, Clegg? Anything else on the Cubbies? No, I mean, I think Wicks is the guy that I was going to mention if Eric didn't. I think that there's a lot of intrigue with some of the arms, like Ben Brown, but I think Ben Brown's a reliever. Uh, Wes Neski showed some inconsistencies. He's no longer a prospect anyway. Porter Hodge is fun, but I think he's a reliever too. I do think we see some Cade Horton. I think we see PCA for most of the season. So, yeah, I think this lineup and rotation are fairly set. I will say that I think there's a chance that Hayden McGeary gets some reps at first base if Matt Mervis yeah. doesn't perform. Like you see, Matty Mervis is going to be in there, but he had a down year in 2023. 
Mm-hmm. Didn't really live up to the AFL hype of 2022. And Hayden McGarry kind of took some of the shine and was really, really good this year. Uh, he was a D3 guy, if I'm not mistaken. It's who impressive. Just absolutely mashed and just transformed his game into just a power hitting prospect that also hit for average and really solid OBP. So it wouldn't shock me if he uh, was up either. He, he was like an 18th round guy or something like that, too, uh, if I recall correctly. Just some guy that was just kind of an afterthought, but yeah. really just flourished. Yep. Got to root for the dogs like that. That's good. Uh, Cincinnati Reds, we kind of talked at the top of the show. They called everybody up. It felt like last year, and it went very, very well for them. Mm-hmm. Anybody else worth calling up, Clegg? Mm-hmm. I mean, they've got Noelvi Marte. This is technically still a prospect, but we know he debuted last year, and he's barely under the threshold to remain a prospect. He had a really good season last year. His contact is underrated with the kind of power that he brings to the table. Um, so I just wrote up the red system and Marte, obviously at the top of that, the system isn't as fun as it was because of all the call-ups that you mentioned. Uh, but they do have some guys that maybe get some reps like uh, Jacob Hurtabies, who <laughs> is a AFL guy. He's an older lefty. He high OBP, a lot of speed, not a lot of power, but he could get some reps in the outfield as a 26 year old. Uh, Reese Hines had a massive breakout, big power guy. Uh, first and second half splits were pretty drastic where he improved his contact rate by over 10 percentage points in the second half. And he's got 30 home run pop, especially in that stadium that could really, really play up. And their arms, I don't know. I'm just not over in Fatchway with a lot of the upper level arms. And I don't think we see like the Chase Petties come up and get time. And I may be wrong on that, but the AAA arms aren't just, they're okay, but not, a, not enough for me to be like infatuated enough with the draft, but. Her to bees will be interesting to see if he gets some some reps down the stretch at least, maybe even by midseason if they have some injuries. Because I think outfield may be a spot where some guys can find reps in Cincinnati. That's very true. That seems to be the only spot, most likely, right now. Anybody else for you, Eric? Yeah, the, the only one that I'll add here um, is like a lot of the other top guys for them after Marte are guys that are you know a year or two away. Uh, the, the Carlos Jorge's, the Hector Rodriguez types. Um, but I'll, I'll throw you know Blake Dunn's name in, into this mix here. A guy that, uh, you know, another guy that wasn't a super high draft pick. He was 15th round guy out of Western Michigan and had 23 home runs and 54 steals this past year, hitting 312. Um, so I think you could see him. Now, he got the double A for 77 games. So I'm assuming he starts in triple A this year and, you know, maybe works his way into that outfield picture as well. And you know, I, I, not huge power. I think he's more of like a, you know, 12, 15 homer type, maybe a little bit more. Maybe I'm underselling the power a little bit, but a you know, good athlete, you know, you know legit runner. And you know can hit hit for an average to get on base too. So yeah, I think he could be a pretty fun guy if he is able to find enough playing time. All right, let's go to one of the um, like Oakland A's versions of the National League in the Colorado Rockies. What do we have for this one, Mister Eric Cross? You know, I think you could see a, a few bat. I, I, let's just completely ignore basically every pitcher um, <laughs> for obvious enough. reasons. But uh, yeah, you could. See some bats. I, I don't think any of them are up super early. They, they have a lot of guys that are kind of on similar kind of trajectories and, and kind of ETAs. Guys like um, Adiel Amador, who I think is one of the more underrated, you know, top prospects in baseball. I have him 14th overall in my prospect ranking. Maybe he's up second half, but he, with the time he missed uh, this this past year, yeah, maybe not. Uh, we'll see. You know, guys like Jordan Beck, Yankee Fernandez, Sterling Thompson. Uh, maybe even Zach Veen, a lot of these guys that were in double A last year. So you can see them you know, maybe later on this year. Um, but I, I think if he gets enough playing time, Hunter Goodman, I think it's still a sneaky play in DCs, you know, catch your first base. Didn't really do much after he came up, but was one of the better power hitters uh, in, in the minor leagues. And you know, let's see where his ADP is. I cannot find my tab. I have 800 tabs open. There we go. Uh, 540. I, I, think, I think that's fair. You know, outfield eligibility, obviously, he might play more outfield than catcher in first. We'll see if he can work back into get, getting maybe dual eligibility even. That would be great. But, you know, good power bat and cores at, you know, 540 range. I'm totally fine with that. What about you, Clegg? Anything of interest in Colorado for you? <laughs> obviously, not a ton. I mean, it's the Rockies. Goodman might find some reps still. I think that he's one that at least has power. Not sure how much. Hit tool he has obviously don't want anything to do with any of their pitchers, and I'm not sure any of their upper level pitching prospects are really worth it anyway at this point. 
Um, they've got some intriguing guys, honestly, in like double A and lower on the pitching side, but it just sucks knowing that they'll never really be usable for fantasy. Where the final destination is. <laughs> yep, as long as they're in that system, for sure. I wouldn't be surprised to see Jordan Beck get some reps. Um, he probably starts the year in AAA, and I bet he could pop off and uh, get some playing time. He's one of their better prospects, in my opinion. But yeah, not a ton of intriguing options here, in my opinion. All right, let's go to Los Angeles Dodgers. We've been joking about it. I wrote down Matt Bush, Miguel Vargas, Andy Pages is down here. I know they got some pitching Great. options as well. So, Clegg, what do you got on the Dodgers? Uh, they just need openings, and I'm afraid there's going to be no openings at all because that's true. We saw them go below the uh, luxury tax tanks. last year just so they yep. could just go insane this year and get like, Otani. I'm not even like you look at this lineup right now on like roster resource. And yeah, the bottom of half of the lineup's kind of like, eh, but that's not going to be the case when all said and done, in my opinion. So I maybe we finally see Michael Bush, but I'm not sure he gets regular playing time. Probably just be a running joke. I think he maybe traded out, like trade this guy to like Pittsburgh or something, just let him mash. Like that would be a, a best case scenario for him. We saw Miguel Vargas um, inconsistencies. I know he graduated technically. Uh, as far as arms. They've obviously got a lot of talent, but did Pepio grad? I think Pepio graduated technically. He, he did, yeah. He should have, yep. yeah. Yeah, he only had 42 innings last year, but I think the service time stuff, he graduated. Um, kind of going down their upper levels, there's a really underrated guy, and this is what the Dodgers do, where they just find these kind of guys that they pop off. And that's Austin Gaithier. Uh, he's an infielder, very versatile, plays all over the board. These are the kind of players that they bring up and just surprise everybody. And he had two stints last year in high and double A and was really good at both in high A to begin the season, six home runs, four stolen bases, but 365, 47, 568. And then in double A, he hit six home runs and swiped 15 bags, but 293, 411, 433. I think he's like on zero radars at all, but I think he's really good. Uh, Andy Pajes, maybe he finally gets a chance. You had mentioned him, put him on the sheet. He can mash what kind of contact he gets to is still a question. But I guess if I'm going to pick an arm here, uh, it's probably Nick Frosso. Who I was waiting for you to say Nick Frosso. Yeah, I mean, he came over from Toronto uh, a year or so ago. He's probably best suited in like a bulk uh, reliever role. Give him two, three innings. I'm not sure he can turn over a lineup multiple times. But the stuff's really good. He just has such a violent delivery. And the command is spotty. I know you look at the walk rates like, oh, they're not so bad, but... I think the command is not as good as people think, uh, considering the walk rates. So ultimately, I like Frosso a lot, but he may be a guy that can give you 100 innings in like a, a bulk reliever role and have some value. I, and the stuff is there for that. What about you, Eric? Anybody else to add on to the Dodgers? Yeah, I was going to mention Frosso if Clegg didn't. And I guess I'll, I'll throw Landon Knack in there. He, you know, he was at a, and then one of those older guys. He's 20. Uh, where'd he go? Age 26 already, so I think he, you know, he gets some runs, see what they do uh, in the rotation. Obviously, it's kind of a lot of question marks, um, but a lot of young guys that could fill those roles, too, if they don't go out and get you know some arms, which they probably will. But, uh, yeah, I'll, but I'll take Michael Bush on the Red Sox. Like, you know, yeah. I'll, give, I'll yeah. give you – I'll give them uh, Verdugo. I think I'll have Verdugo back, and I'll take <laughs> uh, Bush and, like, you know, maybe you want one of these arms, like, you know, a knack or a frass, so I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, I, I I take Bush on the Giants, but that'll never happen. So we're good there. <laughs> um, Miami Marlins, this is a fun team. We've seen a lot of their pitching come up in recent years, but they have a lot of bats that are still kind of wavering in the minor league system here. So Eric, we'll start with you on the Miami Marlins. The Marlins are yeah, they're interesting. They don't have a lot of big name uh, players, especially on the on the hitting side. Now they've kind of graduated all of them. Not that they had a lot of them anyway. Uh, but you know, maybe we you know we're, we're going to see Max Meyer come back. At some point this year, and he's still prospect eligible, uh, coming off an injury. Uh, I want to see where uh, where he's going in. Pretty cheap last time I checked. Yeah, Max Meyer. All right, four fifty five. That's actually a little bit higher than I thought it was going to be, but still fair. Uh, I, I, he was considered, you know, a top ten ish pitching prospect before the injury, and I think he's, you know, still has you know pretty solid upside, good stuff. Uh, you know, fastball slider, you know, changeup as well. Uh, so I think he could be a, a fun arm to take it in that range, given the upside. You know, Xavier Edwards kind of had a, a little bit of a resurgence here this this past year. Obviously, not going to be much in, in the power department, but always been a guy that you know gets on base, steals some bags, that's for a high average. So he's another one to look out for. 
And you know, outside of them, you know, you know, that's really it. You know, they didn't protect uh, Troy Johnston in the um, you know, this this offseason. So I don't know like what the future is with, with Troy Johnston. He was a guy that I thought would be uh, a pretty good part of their plan long term. Um, but yeah, outside of that, the uh, a lot of the, their other guys are kind of younger, like Noble Meyer and Thomas White, and and on all of them probably a year or two, a couple or a couple of years away. So not not a whole lot of intrigue uh, for Miami this year. Anything interest to you, Mr. Chris Clegg? No, the system's not good, and like you said, all the talents in the lower levels. So, like maybe Jacob Barry gets a shot, but I'm not really interested in Barry at all. If I'm going to say one, it's probably like Jacob Amaya, former Dodgers farmhand. They just had too many Jacob Amaya, so they basically <laughs> gave him away to Miami. I think it's for a reliever, but he's an interesting guy. Like he's not flashy, but he could fill a role in that infield. I would think, given who they're rolling out there right now. Exactly. Let's go to Milwaukee Brewers before we go even any deeper here. You mentioned at the top of the show, Jackson Trio, they're trying to lock down, which would lock him into the opening day roster. Right now he has an ADP of 211. I think we all know he's a stud. Not a whole lot of analysis necessary here. But I want to know from you guys, how high should Jackson Trio go, Chris Clegg, if he starts opening day with the Brewers? Yeah, I mean, I think he probably pushes top 125 if he's – gonna if he's if he gets the extension like he's gonna float that high i think i'm comfortable in that range like 125 to 150 probably cheerios made strides but there's still just some concerning things he's young so it may be like some growing pains this year i think everybody's gonna hope that it's a julio rodriguez case but i'm not sure that's that shouldn't be the ex, expect expectation he's more the exception to that rule so yeah i would draft Churio in the right spot especially if he gets that extension. Uh, Robert Gasser is going to be a big target of mine in DCs, especially knowing that there's injuries in this rotation. They just dump Brandon Woodruff. They could trade Corbin Burns. But Gasser is highly, highly underrated in my opinion. He's not flashy, but he gets the job done. He's a high K minus BB guy, and he's just been consistently good. Uh, he throws six pitches 10% of the time or more. The fastball, he commands it up really well. Uh, it's the sweeper has like 18 inches of sweep on it. It's an insane arsenal. And ultimately, one that might be pretty underrated. I'm not sure where Gasser is going right 482. now. 482. Yeah, I think that's a really good spot for him where I think that he could get some serious innings in this rotation and be really, really good. All right, what about you, Eric? What's your thoughts on Trio's ADP and anybody else in Milwaukee for you? Yeah, so right now in 19 DCs is 211, and yeah, I 100% agree. I think that's going to jump. That's going to be cut in half. Uh, if you know, it does the extension, obviously gets in the opening day lineup. I don't know if I'd go that high though. On Langford, I would. I think Langford's more polished, and I think actually has a better you know chance of uh, you know excelling right away. Churio's always taken a little bit of time to get going at every level. And he always has, obviously. You know, the, the upside long term is insanely high, you know, early round fantasy guy. But I, I'm just not completely digging where I think he's going to end up going, which I think Clay get it right pretty much in the nose there. Um, but obviously, you know, a stud in the making with Churio. Uh, I, I think, you know, I don't know how this outfield is going to shake out, especially if Churio is up on opening day. But, uh, you know, I've always been intrigued by Garrett Mitchell. The, yeah, there's some warts in the profile too, but. You know, power speed blend. He, he kind of gave us a little bit of that uh, before the injury. So he's he's a guy that I've been keeping an eye on uh, in all my drafts, especially DCs. You know, you probably see some some Jacob Mizierowski at some point this year. Kind of one of those like Mason Miller types, where it's like super high upside. Can he handle a starter's workload? You know, really fun arm. And then I think another guy that still gets slept on a little bit is Tyler Black. Had a, a really good year. You know, a big. You know, a lot of speed, a little bit of pop there. Uh, can get on base, so he's not another fun guy just to keep an eye on this offseason. All right, let's go to the New York Mets here. It's uh, to to the naked eye, didn't seem like a great system for the upcoming fantasy season, but maybe I'm missing something. So Eric, start us off there. Yeah, I think there are some names, and you know, obviously, the, Ronnie Mauricio, uh, probably the, the guy that'll make the most impact this year. He's one. I've had a hard time like ranking him over the years because it's like so up and down. You know, obviously that the power speed is there, no doubt about that. Like, will he hit for enough average? He's super aggressive. Doesn't strike out a whole ton either, kind of similar to uh 
Rafaela in, in that regard. But uh, I kind of want to see, you know, how he can handle a full season at the major league level if he hits for enough average. But r- really fun player, obviously. You know, maybe we see, you know, some combination of Jet Williams. Probably not. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, maybe more so Luis Angel Cunha, uh, Drew Gilbert, uh, who they obviously just got in multiple trades uh, over the, uh, the trade deadline. But uh, the one kind of still underrated, even though he had a really good year on the pitching side, is Christian Scott. I think you see him for at least probably 15 starts or so. Uh, you know, I saw him a couple of times this year, and he, the dude just hits his spots. And he, ADP is 635, basically free last 10 rounds, or maybe last five rounds or so of your DC. And a guy that's just, he screams, just like number three starter, a guy that's just going to give you a you know, year in, year out, you know, pitch a lot of innings, good ratios, give you some, you know, he can, he can miss bats too. Um, so I, I think he's going to be uh, definitely up at some point. Obviously that rotation is uh, not great. There's a lot of question marks in that rotation, both with performance and durability. So I think you see, again, like 15 plus starts of Christian Scott. And if you do, that 635 ADP is going to be an absolute steal. All righty, Chris, what do you got on the Mets? Pitcher I'll go with is Dominic Hamill. Uh, really, really strong finish to the year in which he posted final nine starts, 48 innings, a 188 ERA, 189 batting average against, 33% K, 9% walk. I mean, he sits mid to upper 90s with the fastball with 20 inches of IVB, which is elite. Like, really, really good stuff there. Uh, throws a slider and a cutter. Both those in a distinct curve that's like a, more of a 12 6 shape with a lot of downward action. I think that he's probably one that stays underrated, but it's been really good. And he's still got some room on the frame to, to add some weight at that. And I'd expect him to get some starts in this rotation. Jose Budo is currently penciling the fifth spot, and that's just not it. <laughs> he's, so, a, he's not good. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a nice way to say it. But you look at the rest of the rotation, it's like, oh, Okay, I like Joey Lucchese. <laughs> I mean, Ty, even like we love Tyler McGill, but he's not. He hasn't been no. great. Like Jose Quintana is your two. Like these guys are going to get a crack. Like him and uh, Hamill and Mike Vasil will, will get reps for sure. Vasil, I thought, would get some reps this year, honestly, but he didn't. And I don't think Christian Scott will be far behind, like you mentioned. Um, he's an elite command guy, one of the best walk rates in the minors this year. So, yeah, the arms are probably the ones I'd look to invest in in the system. All right, let's stay in the NL East, and let's go to the Philadelphia Phillies, who they've called guys up recently. We know there's a few guys that are still there because of injuries and whatnot. So what do you like in Philadelphia, Chris? Johan Rojas is interesting. I think he could be like the cheaper version of Sedan Rafaela, and maybe I'm way off on where they're going. I haven't looked at either, and maybe, I think you said Rafaela was in the, near the 500 range. Yeah, Rojas is 427. Interesting. Okay, never mind. So he's not the cheap version of Stunner Field. I like Rojas, though. He plays a great center field. So I think he's there to stay at this point. He's uh, got some sneaky speed. And actually, I'm not even sure Rojas is a prospect anymore as I'm sitting here talking about him. I think he probably graduated. But here I am ranting and raving about him. I'm going to go over to the bullpen and go Orion Kirkering, who everybody now loves as he came up down the stretch, was awesome. He pitched awesome in the playoffs, too. Had some big spots where I think he gets some saves, which would be fun. Uh, a lot of talent there in that arm. They just traded away a guy who I thought would get reps in Oliver Dunn, who was a stud in the AFL. They traded him away to uh, Milwaukee, which is interesting. So you might find some reps. I guess the outfielder that I'm looking at is uh, Simone Muziati. Uh, he's interesting. Very high contact bat. He's got some speed as well. Triple A the entire year last year, seven home runs, 26 bags, hit 296 with a 358 OBP. It's not a lot of power, but contact and speed oriented guy where he could get some reps, but not a ton in the system, if I'm being honest, that would really intrigue me. I think Mick Abel's probably still needs some seasoning in the minors, maybe see him late. I think Griff McGarry's probably a reliever, honestly. He just hasn't shown the command where he could stick there. So while there's some fun talent in the arms, I'm not sure we see them make a huge impact this year. Well, I see Eric's not an able fan. Any, anybody else you're interested in? No, I actually am, but it's more so <laughs> it's, I'm 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 not mad at Mick Abel. I'm just disappointed because <laughs> the stuff is so good. Like this is like 
high end starter stuff, but he just hasn't made really any strides with the command and control. I mean, the walk rate's still up, you know, up in the 12 to 14% range, the command, like I've seen either two or three of able starts. I can't remember at this point, but it's like been the same thing every time. Like, Oh, oh good stuff. But the final line is like four innings, you know, four hits, three runs, two walks, you know, five strikes. It's like, it's so frustrating because you see the upside there. And I still think there's a path to him being an impact fantasy arm, but the fact that he just hasn't made really any strides is concerning. And that's the reason why I've kind of started dropping him down my rankings a little bit. But yeah, the real one I was kind of looking at, you know, obviously Chris mentioned was Orion Kirk ring. Obviously great stuff could play into the, you know, the late inning uh, role there. Um, maybe we see some Gabriel Rincones is another name to throw out there, but yeah, a lot of their guys too, like the Aiden Millers, the Crawfords, they're all kind of uh, a couple of years away. All right, let's go Pittsburgh Pirates here. You guys said Paul Skeens earlier, like probably not, but we'll see. So, Eric, anything in Pittsburgh? Like they're always a young team, but when guys get called up, it's kind of disappointing still. Yeah, they they, they haven't really hit on a lot of prospect recently. And, and I, I like Skeens a lot, but not really for this year. I think he's up this year, but I just don't think it's going to be as early as people think. And the ADP, 278 ADP. Yeah, no, absolutely not. It. Even it, like his min pick, or excuse me, the max pick 350. I'm, I, I don't even like it there. I just don't think he's up. I think he's, you know, maybe you get 50 innings out of him. I just don't think it's going to be as much as people think. And I think he's obviously potentially, you know, an impact arm long term. I just don't think that big impact is going to come until 2025. And, you know, maybe, you know, Nick Gonzalez, I, th- I think, is still prospect eligible. I saw him on my sheet. He is prospect eligible. Yeah, so I think he could still, you know, play a role for this team. But you know, th- there's, you know, some red flags in his profile, too, uh, in terms in terms of contact. You know, can be you know, a little bit of power speed in there, but you know, definitely some issues there. So I think he's going to be a guy that end of the year will probably get a lot of playing time just because they don't really have a lot of, any you know, anybody in, in the way for the most part. But I think it's... Not going to be great. I think maybe some low end production, best case scenario with Nick Gonzalez. You know, maybe, maybe you know, on, on the pitching side, maybe you see some Jared Jones uh, come up. You know, maybe, maybe some um, Anthony Salamento, but probably more so Jones. Maybe you see a little like Jack Brannigan uh, come up. I'm not really big on Priester, who came up and debuted. Yeah, uh, again, it's it's going to be innings, but not great innings. Um, so I think that's kind of where you're, where you're at. It's a lot of these, uh, maybe some Jace Bowen, uh, you know, maybe him and Brandon again come up at, at some point and kind of fill some roles in, in the infield and outfield there. But and not a lot of guys that I'm, you know, super intrigued by. What about you, Clegg? Anybody for you? Yeah, it's not a super intriguing system. We saw Jared Tree Olo come up. He exhausted eligibility. I'm seeing too. Um, golly, it's a... There should be opportunities for guys, but it doesn't feel like there's a lot actually, which is weird to say. They're just kind of filling the lineup with, with like just a bunch of guys that <laughs> can fill the lineup. Um, Nick Gonzalez probably should get a consistent shot to perform, and he we saw him come down the stretch and he got 128 plate appearances, so he just barely stayed under. Alika Williams also came up; he didn't do much of anything. Um, it's not really a, it's a, the system's gotten better, but it's better at the lower levels, in my opinion. Yeah. From an arm standpoint, I think Jared Jones is probably the next guy up uh, where he's been up and down. He improved this year in the standpoint of he was able to have his stuff stick for more than two, three innings. And he's got a big fastball up to like 98, 99, got some good secondaries, but there's inconsistencies and durability issues. And the ability to handle a starter's workload from Jones, but I think you'll see him in the rotation at some point. Uh, Bubba Chandler made big strides, but I don't think we see him this year. And then there's obviously Skeens, who probably comes up later, and there's the guys that aren't as intriguing like Jackson Wolf and Kyle Nicholas who could get starts that just have zero fantasy intrigue, in my opinion. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the San Diego Padres, who have a couple guys. Graham Pauly was a, a name that was chatted around a lot even towards the end of last season. As someone to look at, uh, Jackson Merrill has had some hype as well. So, Chris, we'll start with you on this one. What do you think of San Diego? I think Merrill does come up and get consistent playing time, maybe the first after the first couple of months. There's some chatter that he was going to come up in September. That didn't quite happen. Uh, but Merrill does have some attributes that would make him a viable asset pretty quickly. 
Uh, he's a high OBP guy. He makes a ton of contact. Um, I lied about the OBP. He wasn't as good this year. But the contact, he makes so much contact, puts so many balls in play. He's got decent power and speed, not like super flashy, going to wow you kind of power and speed. But there's use in this profile with Merrill, and I do think we see him up soon. I'll say the arm that I'm watching really closely is Jairo Iriarte, where this rotation needs arms. And Iriarte was really, really good last year, in which and he was in high A for most of the year. At a 3 1 ERA, he jumped to double A where it was a uh, 4 3, but strikeout rates were just stupid high. Double A was 40.5%, it's 30% high A. Stuff's there. I mean, like a slider that just, just absolutely devastating. Hitters can't touch it. The fastball, easy plus pitch, ton of ride up in the zone, high velo. So I wouldn't be surprised if Iriarte gets a shot in the rotation sooner than later. And even though he'll only be 22, these are the kind of arms that we've seen San Diego push. And I think he's got the stuff to be successful. Interesting. What about you, uh, Eric? Yeah, not a lot to add here. I, I think you see, you know, several or at least a few second half ETA guys, you know, Merrill, maybe Snelling, uh, Graham Pauly, you know, Jacob Marcy, guys like that. Um, but I, I Again, I don't think there's a lot of like big impact. I think 2025, you'll see some of these guys really make some impact. The guys that you know we already mentioned here, uh, so, you know, they they have you know seven guys for me that are you know top 110 in my overall rankings, and a couple more that are interesting as well. I, I like the Ariarchy you mentioned that that Clegg did, um, but I just wanted to ask you one question, Bubba. You know, obviously you've been you know, on NFBC for a long time. Did you ever think you'd see a 17 year old catcher have an ADP on? on NFBC right now with Ethan Salas? No, it's nuts. It's nuts. And if <laughs> Salas comes up, kudos to you guys. But there's no, zero he, chance I'll be drafting him. Like, no. he's been great. He's moving up the, the system. It's awesome. It's fun. And no, no, not yeah. for me, dog. No, he, he, I I would – he's not up this year. Just, he, he's been taking in three out of 19. 17 years old, people. Like, <laughs> this isn't rookie of the year. This is funny. <laughs> I, when we went over to the Padres, I, I quickly did a you know, control F to find him. I'm like, is he on here? Has he been taken? I'm like, yep. Three out of 19 DCs he's been taken. It's an ADP. is like 730, whatever. But uh, it's funny. You never thought you'd see a 17-year-old right, catching and, and, and and like, not, not even trying to be mean. I would love to just – those three people, tell me why. Yeah. <laughs> tell, just tell me why. Like, I don't, I'm not trying to – I'm just curious. What was your logic between – now you have 49 players on your roster. That's cool. Right. But, yeah, I'm just curious. So – um, we can speed through this one if you want. Uh, San Francisco Giants, um, you know, Eric, what do you got on this wonderful establishment? You know, I, I think there's there's some sneaky talent uh, in the San Francisco. Oh, don't don't butter no, me. No, okay. I, I mean, there's not any like I think for most like the two biggest names are obviously Kyle Harrison and Marco yeah. Luciano, both of which got time uh, this past year. Both of which I'm probably a little lower on than a consensus. Harrison's very talented, but he just screams inconsistency. So I think he's going to be one of those guys where, and we even saw it in his short time with, with the giants, like one really good start, then one like erratic start. I think this is going to be the case with him. Yeah. I paid um, two fifty ADP too. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm out of that ADP. Luciano, I think is overrated for fantasy. These decent bat, but I think he gets ranked too highly for fantasy, but yeah, I think you see some, um, probably maybe see a little bit of Carson Wisenhunt, uh, this year. Uh, maybe some some Mason Blacks, a couple a couple of arms there, um, maybe some Hayden Bird song, another arm. Um, again, these are late round dart throws at best, but uh, a lot of the other guys, you know, may, probably more so twenty twenty five guys, um, or or even beyond. Maybe some decent bats in, in the lower levels. You know, got guys like you know Walker Martin, Bryce Eldridge, you know, guys like that, Rainer Arias, but those are more so uh, you know twenty twenty five and beyond guys. Anything else on the Giants, Mr. Chris Clegg? I mean, Mason Black, I think, is certainly one that could get some reps. Also, look out for uh, Kai Wee Tang. Uh, and the system, I think that there's some intrigue there that he could throw some innings uh, next year in San Francisco. He's got a lot of strikeout upside. Uh, got some command issues. Had a string of bad luck last year where – he had a very high BABIP at both stops and low strand rates. But, I mean, in AA, he ran a 3-4 FIP. Then he went to the PCL and had a 4-2-2 ERA, which I'd say is pretty solid for the PCL, Yeah, all things nice. considered. Yeah, I mean, you look at what Brandon Fought did out there. And Tang has an interesting arsenal. I mean, the fastball is fine, but 
I think the slider is firmly above average or plus, and maybe just maybe he gets some reps and is under very under the radar guy that probably doesn't even get drafted in most spots. But yeah, if I'm looking at an arm, there's probably Mason Black. Obviously, um, you know, uh, Kyle Harrison is going to get drafted. Uh, Wizen Hunt with the injury, I just don't know. Like, there's some major concern. I know he's expected to return by spring training, but the elbow sprain, not ideal. So we'll see how that all develops. All right, two more teams. I appreciate you guys tonight. It's been a, a good one here. St. Louis Cardinals, like Mason Wynn, got a little cup of coffee last year. Didn't live up to the hype, but still young and probably has something in the tank. Anything else you see with the Cardinals, Clegg? I mean, I think Victor Scott, first and foremost. <laughs> I think that for fantasy purposes, Victor Scott is the number one prospect in the system now for me. He showed everything that you want to see in person, and it kind of all – backs in the underlying data too. Not going to be a massive power guy, but he's a better version of Esther Ruiz, kind of what I've been saying all off season. He's what people wanted Esther Ruiz to become where he's got power. He's got a better hit tool than Ruiz and he's got equal amount of speed and stolen base upside. I don't know if he gets consistent reps right out of the gate. They don't have a spot right now, but I bet this lineup looks a little different yeah. come opening day. 100%. I think that we've, probably see Tyler O'Neill no longer there. There's rumors of Tommy Edmond being traded. There could be some openings for Victor Scott, and he's a pure center fielder. I think he plays a plus or better center field, and with the speed, like he could be an instant contributor there. They filled out the rotation with uh, all 35 and up, so not really any direct spots right now, even though there was talk about trying to trade Steven Matz, but I'm not sure who would take Steven Matz on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who, who wants Steven Matz? So let's, let's be honest. I, I could see a Steven Matz, uh, O'Neill combo package somewhere <laughs> just to like chop them both off. Yeah. I can well, see I, it happening. You know where I can see that, you know, happening. The Giants. The, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, yeah. The second yeah. I saw, I saw it tweeted out yesterday that Steven Matz is being shot through. I'm like, great. Giants are going to get Matz and O'Neill. I can already see this coming a mile yeah. away. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but Matz is just too young for the rotation. He's 32 and a half, and everybody else is 35 plus. But um, Fit right in with Wood and company and Cobb and company. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I don't know if there's opportunities for arms, but they have Libertor, who he's graduated, but he wasn't great. Uh, Gordon Graceffo and Michael McGreevy, who have not debuted yet, but there are arms that aren't like super intriguing for fantasy. I'm not sure that Tink Hens or Takoa Roby, which are two of their best arms, are, you know, they're, they may be up later in the season, but they're not going to be early season call ups. But I'd say Victor Scott is probably the number one target of prospects, like outside of Mason Wynn, who I may target Scott over Wynn. And I'm sure the ADP gap is pretty substantial. Scott's and ADP is wild. It's 641, as high as 431, as low as 743. Yeah, he was sitting like 700s when we were in the at, out in Arizona, and I figured it would steadily rise, mm -hmm. and it probably will be even higher as the offseason moves on. But hopefully, it stays like around 500 at best. I'm hoping that's where it sits. Nice. What about you, Eric? Anything else on St. Louis? Yeah, I'll just add uh, Thomas to Jay Z uh, really quick. He's his ADP is 620 right now. Can you know he's played multiple infield positions. This probably could take. An admin trade or an injury to open Sounds up time like a for him. player right there. Yeah, but no, and he, he's a pretty <laughs> a pretty solid bat. You know, nice little power speed blend can get on base. So yeah, I think he could be he could be a, a fun fantasy guy, especially with the you know right now he's just listed at second base uh, on NFBC, but a guy that could you know play into you know other eligibilities uh, as well. So he, he's a kind of a fun little name there to add him. All right, last team for us: the Washington Nationals. Uh, James Wood, Robert Hassel, Dylan Cruz. Uh, there's a lot of interesting names in the system. We saw young guys last year at Abrams and company, Lane Thomas. Like They're an interesting young ball club. So, Eric, what do you have on this Nationals team? Yeah, I, I think the you know, right off the bat, the, the two big names, obviously, you mentioned Dylan Cruz, James Wood, both I have in my top 10 at six and nine, respectively. And I, I think you see them both, you know, probably mid season, uh, you know, July, August or so. I think, I think is when they both come up. And obviously, you know, Cruz was, you know, what, if not the best, one of the best hitters in, in college the last few years. You know, it struggled a bit in double A, but I don't really put much weight under that. This is still a potential studly bat uh, that can give you a little bit of everything, especially you know with the bat. Nick also had double digit steals as well. So uh, I think he's going to be up, and I think he'll have a nice impact when he does. James Wood, I mean, 
you you see him you saw him slide down rankings a little, just a little bit. He's got us more so top five. Now he's more like you know around ten, give or take a little bit. Uh, it's because there were some struggles with some strikeouts. Obviously, bigger guy, six seven, uh, but very athletic guy as well. And that part of his game gets a little bit undervalued uh, and, and not talked about enough. Uh, so I think he could be you know, a nice power speed blend. Where does he average end up? But he's a, a guy up second half. And then this one other name to add. Moving over to the, you know, maybe you see DJ Hers. Um, I'm still not, I'm still kind of lukewarm on Hers, but Cade Cavalli is probably back uh, this year and a guy that's you know six seventy six ADP right now on NFBC. You know, I, with him, I think there's a, a lower floor there. There's some command issues with Cade Cavalli, but he also misses bats, or at least he did. We'll see what he looks like, you know, post uh, you know injury and surgery. But uh, just like a fun upside guy that you can get in the last you know handful of rounds or so. Uh, Clay, what do you got on the Washington Nationals? Yeah, I'm not sure that they're hyper aggressive with Cruz. Maybe we see him later in the season. It's kind of my read. I just don't see them contending and starting this clock. An org like this probably isn't going to do that. But I think Cade Cavalli is the one that's kind of forgotten about yep. and how good he was and the strides that he had made in 2022 uh, before the injury. We know he missed all this season, but he's back playing catch. He feels really good. I think that he's going to be ready for the season. He's going to be a heavy investment for me. And I wouldn't be surprised if he is their best arm this year. He's got all the upside in the world, but he seems to be kind of forgotten about because he came up, he looked terrible, and then he got hurt and missed the entire 2023 season. So I think Cavalli's probably my biggest target out of this farm system if I'm looking for 2024. Awesome. All right, let's do a just rapid fire listener questions here to get you out of here, uh, especially in the chat here. Jimmy D asked, Do you guys, we'll go with just one guy can answer. Eric, do you hope we see Roki Sasaki this season? I don't think, I don't think we're going to see him this year. Okay. I, I, I don't think he's, he's, I don't think he's coming over until next year. If I don't, if he, I don't he can't come until 2026 unless, yeah, 2026, unless yeah. a team is willing to pay a massive posting fees, like due to the, the rules. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Stuff. So he knows. could try to come over, but an MLB org would have to be willing to pay a crap ton of money, which usually doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. Okay. That, that's what it was. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. I would love to see him, but yeah, I, I, I'd say it's sub 5% chance. All right. Uh, reducing juice. One of his questions, can Keston Hirstead gain outfield or first base eligibility? Is UT only. You guys think he gains anything else? Yeah, I think he's first base. Um, he probably plays first base enough outfield to potentially be both. And yeah. I think he would have gotten the eligibility had he came up sooner last year. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. All right, Eric, I'll ask you this one. Is MacArthur now second in line for the for saves with the addition of Nick Anderson in Kansas City? I, I guess, yeah. I think that's that's safe to say, but I, I still think he gets some saves. Like I don't think, you know, obviously Anderson's had, you know, some injury histories as well. So can you trust him for a full season? Uh so I think MacArthur you know, maybe Anderson leads the team in saves, but I still think MacArthur you maybe gets like ten to fifteen saves or something like that. Uh, Clegg, can Dominic Canzone carve out a full-time role with Teoscar Gunn? Possibly, but it depends on what else Seattle does, which they seem to be trying to be cheap. So uh, it's highly possible. Uh, Eric, could it be wise to speculate on Prelander Baroa at the very end for saves? Munoz hasn't been the model of health, but there are other arms there too. Yeah, just due to yeah, obviously Munoz still has a way to go with being like that lockdown full season guy. Well, that remains to be seen. But yeah, you know, what you said like all the other names in that bullpen that they have, you know, Matt Brash, you know, especially I think would be the guy that would step in, um, and maybe even does get a lot of saves this year. So you know, maybe uh, you know, late rounds if you want to get maybe get maybe give you a, you know a couple saves here and there. I think Broa could be a target for that, Chris. Uh... How high or how to value Abner Uribe right now? How high could he rise if Williams gets traded by or during spring training? Well, if he if Williams gets traded, he's probably in the closer role, which means his stock absolutely soars. I think just from a stuff standpoint, he's probably the best arm in that bullpen behind Williams. So, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, he probably pushes to like top one hundred status. He's probably a top ten closer if he if Williams is traded and he's penciled in that role um i'll ask you this one eric since uh, i know you already started doing dcs i believe uh, at least one um he asks, how many roster spots are you willing to use on a player who may not or will not be on the opening day roster and how has that changed since last year 
Um, I I think it's hard to put an exact number on it. Um, but uh, you know, out of the fifty roster spots, I'm probably looking at ten or less. Uh, that there, there are guys that are quote unquote prospects that aren't going to be up opening day, uh, and then maybe that's even high. Maybe it's more like five or six, and uh, more of those guys are in the later rounds. And like I mentioned earlier, a little more aggressive in in the kind of middle part of the drafts. Um, but yes, still not going after unless I'm like enamored like I am with like Wyatt Langford. Still not going after those guys early. All right, uh, Clay Thomas Travato on Twitter says, "Will Will Skeens, Will Skeens, Cruz Langford make the opening day roster?" I think you guys are good on Langford, not the other two, correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Then I'll ask you this part, Clay. If so, if they make it, when should they be drafted? Just a rough number is what they're asking. I think Langford top one hundred is more than fair. <laughs> All right, perfect. Sounds good to me. And then I believe we have one more question here, and then I'll get you guys out of here. Yep, and it's from the doc, Mike Carter, who I love, and I feel bad every episode because I crap on the White Sox every episode. Um, hey, so does he. He does. Yeah, so it's fair. I think it's actually lethargic probably for him, like therapeutic <laughs> to hear someone else say it's not a White Sox fan. But uh, I'll ask you this one, and this will be for both of you guys. So Eric first, then uh, and Clegg. Mike Carter wants to know what prospect that you saw in the AFL surprised you the most, either better or worse than you thought, Eric. You know, I mean, go back to what we, you know, Chris was talking about with Victor Scott. I mean, obviously we we knew the speed was there, but he really impressed with the bat, uh, and you know, Clegg talked about it too. And every even the, even his outs, like every there was so many quality of bats, so many hard hit balls. Some of them are right at the outfielders, but yeah, he, he really impressed me with with the bat and. Thank you, someone that you know. We'll see one of the biggest jumps in my prospect rankings from you know end of season to you know the next update in a month or two. What about you, Clegg? Uh, yeah, on the good, I would say that it was certainly Scott AJ Vukovic is also a fun one that I really yep. liked. Um, on the bad, it was Kevin Parada. I was slated to see him in season, but he got called to Double A right before Brooklyn was down here. Ty A, he just looked terrible, like. Prada doesn't look like a major leaguer right now, unfortunately. That's a bummer. But that'll wrap us up. You guys are amazing. Thanks for uh, me letting me take this much of your time. Didn't think it would be this way, but it worked <laughs> out pretty darn good. So I appreciate you all. Before we head on out, promote your stuff, Eric. Where can they find you? What you got going on? Yeah, no, th thanks for having me. This was uh, this two hours flew by, honestly. Uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of good stuff, obviously. A lot of good prospects to talk about. Uh, you have Twitter at Eric Cross zero four. Uh, obviously, a lot of my work is uh, over at toolshedfantasy.com, my Patreon, doing you know team prospect rankings, you know early 2024 rankings, player profiles, a lot of fun stuff there. Over at Rotoballer and FTN as well, and obviously on the Toolshed Pod. What about you, Mr. Chris Clegg? Yep, the DynastyDugout.com. Everything you need to know is there, and on Twitter at Roto Clegg. Awesome. Well, these guys are great human beings and great fantasy analysts. I thank you guys for joining me. Always a pleasure chatting it up with you guys. Enjoyed it, Bubba. Appreciate Thanks, you. All right, everybody. This is Bench with Bubba, episode 613 with Chris Clegg and Eric Cross. Catch you all next time.